All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being patient. Um, I know we've got a lot of folks here, and so we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. As I just explained to the folks outside, the record is going to be left open after today for people to submit testimony, so there will be a chance for everybody to res respond to everything that comes up and have a chance to uh, get in whatever they want to get in. Um, so um, my name is Fred Wilson. I'll be the hearings officer for today's public hearing. This is the time set aside for the public hearing in the youth with a mission conditional use permit application case. The file number is 21-004. Today is an opportunity for people to testify, to submit evidence, to make legal arguments. I don't make a final decision today. As I said, the record will be left open, so I won't make a decision until after the record's been closed. Everybody who shows up and has signed that uh, sign-in sheet and has submitted anything will get sent a copy of the decision in the mail. Um, a few things that a hearings officer has to talk about before every public hearing. I need to disclose whether I've had any ex parte contacts, that's any discussions about the merits of the case before today, and I haven't. The only thing I know about this case is what I've seen in the planning file and in the staff report and in all the exhibits that have been submitted. Um, I also need to disclose whether I'm biased, whether I'm for or against the application for any reason other than the merits. I'm not. I'm not familiar with any of the parties. Um, I live in West Salem. I don't live anywhere near the, the, the subject property. I have no reason to feel one way or the other. Uh, finally, I need to disclose whether I have any conflicts of interest. I don't. Um, again, I live in West Salem. Uh, I don't own any property in Marion County, let alone anywhere near this property. So no conflicts of interest. Um, if you haven't been to one of these hearings before, the way it did work is we're going to start with the staff report. After the staff report, the applicant will have an opportunity to present their case. Um, after that, anybody else who's in favor of the application can testify. I think that's just the, the folks who are part of the applicant's team today. After that, then we'll have a chance for people who are opposed to the application. Um, we've got a lot of people out here today. Um, again, we have to deal with the spacing requirements, so not everybody is in the room at the same time. So um, with this many people, we're going to restrict testimony to about five minutes per person. And after you testify, um, I think there might be a few of the people who are sort of, sort of in charge of the opposition who might stay. But other folks, if once you testify, if you could leave, that'll let, let somebody else come in and be able to testify. Um, um, and after that, uh, staff will have a chance to respond to any issues that come up. And finally, the applicant will have an opportunity for final rebuttal since they have the burden of proof. Um, the, again, this is a conditional use permit. The, uh, the Marion County Code provision at issue primarily is 17.128.01 uh, in sequence, particularly the conditional use approval criteria of 17.128.040. Um, so when you do testify, um, even though we've got sign-in sheets, just so it shows up on the record, please make sure to give us your full name, spell your last name, and then I'm going to have to swear everybody in. Um, when you testify, make sure to raise any and all issues you have. Under state law, if you don't raise those issues, you may be precluded from raising them in the future, any further proceedings or appeals of this case. Um, the applicant, if you think any of the proposed conditions of approval may be unconstitutional exactions or any other problems with them and make sure you raise those issues or you may be, pre be precluded from raising them in the future as well. Um, uh, also direct your testimony to the approval criteria. Again, those are the ones in the conditional use uh, uh, standards of 17.128.040. Um, the approval criteria are the only thing I can make my decision based upon. So even if somebody makes an argument about why, for instance, this is a terrible development, you shouldn't approve it, it's awful, even if it's the great argument, if it doesn't have anything to do with the approval criteria, I just can't consider it. Um, and on the other hand, even if I think this is the, the best thing I've ever seen in the world, if it doesn't meet all the approval criteria, I can't approve it. So those are the only things I can make my decision based upon are the approval criteria. So if we get into, uh, I don't want people getting into any sort of personal attacks or getting off on tangents that don't have anything to do with the approval criteria. Um, we've got a lot of folks here, um, people taking time off from work. Um, if things get really out of hand, we'll just have to shut it down and come back again sometime. And I, I know nobody wants to do that, so I've never had to do that before, so I'm sure it won't happen today. But if everybody could just try to be polite and cordial and stick to the issues, that would be, that would be much appreciated. Um, if you haven't turned off your cell phones, this would be a good time to do it. And I think, I think we've taken care of all the preliminary matters. 
So with that, I think we can turn to the staff report. Um, when you want to, when you come up to testify, if you have any objections to that, you can raise it when you okay. come up. And I did. I, uh, I saw there was a number of things that were submitted either today or yesterday, perhaps. And so I had a chance to briefly glance through uh, Mr. Lean's submission that the opponent's attorney uh, has provided, uh, but I haven't been through it in detail. And then apparently there are quite a few other things that were submitted. Um, that I haven't had a chance to take a look at. I looked at everything that came in uh, that I was given, um, but those things are new, so I haven't had a chance to look at all of those. Um, so I think with that, we will turn to the staff report. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the record, this is Ryan Dyer. Uh, the subject property is located at uh, 7085 Battle Creek Road Southeast. It's approximately 32 acres and is comprised of eight separate tax lots. Uh, the property is developed with multiple structures. Uh, uses include housing, um, office space, uh, maintenance shops, and uh, various spaces for religious practices. Uh, the property is located in the Marion County designated sensitive groundwater overlay and the uh, Oregon Water Resources designated South Salem groundwater limited area. Uh, Battle Creek um, is a uh, perennial stream that runs through the property. Um, and it's buffered by a 100-year floodplain. Uh, some portions of the property are located in uh, the geologically hazardous area overlay zone. Uh, properties to the west and north are zoned SA, uh, Special Agriculture, and AR, um, Acreage Residential. Uh, most adjacent properties are developed as acreage home sites. Uh, properties to the south and the east are zoned AR and are also developed with uh, dwellings and other residential structures. Uh, approval to operate a church-related school and conference facility on the property was originally granted in 1980 through conditional use uh, number 8035. Uh, various expansions have been granted since the initial approval. Um, these approvals are listed in number five um, under facts in the staff report. The applicant proposes to expand the existing campus through approval of an updated conditional use master plan. Uh, previous approvals required that all expansions uh, be approved by conditional use permit. Um, the criteria for approving a conditional use in the AR zone are found in section 17, 128, 40 of the Marion County Code and listed in item number seven of the staff report. Uh, upon review of the application, staff found that the applicant failed to provide sufficient evidence to satisfy three of the six criteria. Uh, staff concerns stem uh, from the applicant's failure to provide evidence that adequate water can be provided um, to meet the needs of the proposed expansion and that the use will not adversely impact groundwater in the area. Uh, due to these deficiencies, uh, staff also believes that the proposal then is not in harmony uh, with the purpose and the intent of the AR zone. Um, the applicant provided a 2018 um, hydrogeology review that concluded uh, the use can be supported by drawing 20,000 gallons um, of water per day without negatively impacting the aquifer. Uh, the applicant's current usage appears to be compliant with that standard, um, but the hydrogeology review stated in uh, Table 2 of that review um, that between 2012 and 2018, the median amount of water used um, at the Youth with the Mission facilities was 14.01 um, acre feet uh, per year. Uh, or an estimated um, 12,507 gallons per day. Um, this is within the amount exempted um, under ORS 537-545. Uh, with the projected growth, um, however, the hydrogeology review estimates an increase to 47.91 acre feet per year, uh, which corresponds to approximately uh, 42,771 um, gallons per day. Um, correspondence with the Oregon Water Resources Department uh, concludes that, that uh, the total amount um, allowed under the statute would be 22.4 acre feet per year or 20,000 gallons per day, um, 15,000 of which is for residential uses, can be used for residential uses, and 5,000 of which can be used for a commercial use. Um, any usage above the exempted uses uh, would require the applicant to obtain a water right um, with the Oregon Water Resources Department. 
the applicant did not discuss um, in their application how they um, intend to comply with this requirement and comments provided by the Oregon Water Resources Department indicated that the applicant um, does not fully uh, comprehend the statutory limits of water usage and that the water right um, might be challenging to obtain and would require periodic renewal. Uh, correspondence with Oregon Water Resources Department indicate as well that uh, nearby wells being monitored by the department, um, MARI 18140 and MARI 17924 have been shown um, an overall declining trend uh, and noted year-to-year uh, -year variability. Um, however, it should be noted that the department um, did not attribute uh, those declines to any particular use or users. Um, additionally, the peer review completed by uh, Russ Bunker of that hydrogeology review uh, with Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions uh, dated 3-26-2019 uh, indicates that there was a mismatch uh, between the well log uh, records included in the applicant's hydrogeology review and the log records in the Oregon Health Authority's drinking water uh, services system. Both uh, Mr. Bunker and uh, the Oregon Water Resources Department recommended that this mismatch be addressed. Um, cumulatively, these findings suggest that the applicant did not demonstrate uh, they could provide enough um, uh, adequate rural services and, um, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> fix my mask. Uh, cumulatively, the findings suggest that the applicant did not demonstrate uh, they could provide adequate rural services and that they will not have a significant impact on the area's groundwater or that the proposal is in harmony with the purpose and intent of the AR zone. Um, therefore, staff did not find the criteria in 17-128-40 C, D, or A to be met. Um, it should be noted that a considerable amount of testimony has been submitted to the record for this case, uh, much of it from nearby property owners expressing various concerns, uh, some of which are water related, um, but also concerns about uh, the floodplain, um, the capacity of the on-site septic system, uh, the rural character of the area, increased traffic and roadway safety, uh, noise and the maximum amount, number of attendees at the property during special events. Uh, staff did not find adequate evidence to recommend denial based on these factors. Um, and staff are available to answer any questions um, about the application or the staff reports. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, why don't we just go through these like one approval criteria at a time, criterion at a time. Um, so the first one is that the conditional use as described by the applicant will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zone. And then you look at the purpose and the intent of the zone is 17, 128.010. Um, and so my big question here is um, the last sentence of, of that, of 0.010 says, it is the intent that residential sites be provided with adequate water supply and wastewater disposal without exceeding the environmental and public service capabilities of the area or compromising the rural character of the area. And there's been a lot of testimony from, um, from opponents and also from opponent's attorney that I just was able to glance through that sort of, that they hone in on the, the phrase or the words, the rural character of the area. And they're, they're, one of their big arguments is that there's, there's so many people there, they're gonna be here, the density is gonna be so great, this is like a small town that um, that compromise, just, just the proposed use itself compromises the rural character of the area. And when I look at that sentence, um, it seems to me that compromising the rural character of the area is referring back to the adequate water supply and wastewater disposal. And that you, you look at, you know, they could theoretically have an adequate water supply and wastewater disposal, but it could be of such a large scale or sort of, you know, like city kind of facilities that it would compromise the rural character of the area. But I don't think, or it doesn't look to me like that sentence means that you can just look independent of adequate water supply or wastewater disposal and say, oh yes, there's so many people there, this is no longer, this compromises the rural character of the area. And from the staff report, I can't really tell which way you guys are going on that because it looks a little bit of both. So my question is, how does staff interpret that sentence? Uh, my understanding is the staff historically have looked at criteria um, B through F to interpret um, criteria A, which is uh, deals with the, the harmony of the purpose and intent of the zone. Does, 
Does that answer your question? Not exactly. Um, some of those other things don't have anything to do with water or water supply or wastewater disposal. Some of them do a little bit, but so. So uh, what if there? What if there's? What if you think the traffic? Would, let's say if, I know everybody doesn't, but if everybody agreed, oh yeah, this traffic makes it seem like it's urban, not rural. Would that come from? Would that? Would that not be in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zone, in your opinion? I think it's staff opinion. Uh, if we, so I think it's um, B deals with the increase in traffic. Um, and so I suppose, yes, I think if, uh, if there were findings to support um, that the use would uh, increase tra traffic beyond the capacity of the existing roadway, um, then we, staff would consider that to. Um, right, that, that, would, that would obviously violate um, Sub B, because that's asking about the capacity. Let's say, let's say, and I know people will say this is the case, let's say Battle Creek Road had tons of capacity and could handle you know, as many cars as Lancaster. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't violate the capacity, but it would still make it urban. Would that violate subsection A? Um, can you, sorry, can you say that one more time? Okay, the, the, sort of the crux of what I'm getting at is that that last sentence, it looks to me, that when you look at compromising the rural character of the area, you're only looking at the adequate water supply or the wastewater disposal. And so, I can't tell, and it's, the opponents obviously are saying that's not the case. Right. And so, but I can't tell from the staff report which way you're going on that. Uh, I, I would say no, we were not only looking at water. We only had findings to uh, conclude that um, the, the water was the crux of the issue for us, um, but we also looked at um, the evidence submitted uh, by the applicant, um, the traffic study submitted by the applicant, and used that. If, if the findings had found that uh, the capacity of Battle Creek Road was going to be um, under threat because of this proposal, then um, I think we would have concluded that, um, and B was found not to have been met, then we would have also um, concluded that uh, the rural character of the um, the zone was um, under threat from the traffic, if that if that makes sense. Okay, um, but but by concentrating on B through F, that doesn't address the opponent's argument that there are just so many people there. So what what's your position on? And if they just by having so many people, can it eventually compromise the rural character of the area? Uh, I think it's a good question. This is uh, my understanding of how the department has historically interpreted A and the rural character question. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to B. Um, so traffic, um, it looked like there was initially some confusion about the engineering looked like, looked at the 2000s. There were some problems they identified with the 2017 uh, TIA, it looked like that got cleared up and that the, the engineering actually addressed the 2020 TIA. Um, is that right? That's correct, right? Yes, correct. Okay. And so, um, I don't mean Mr. Asby isn't the best person to talk about this, but um, the, I, I, I had a, a quick glance at uh, Mr. Lean's submission and he's arguing that the TIA did not include, I think, like 90 people who are day users or something like that. I, I don't know what that's all about at this point, but um, the, for the TIA, um, if, if that's the case, that it didn't consider 100 people using the site, would, that, would, would you need to see another TIA? Um, would that, how would that affect your analysis? Um, again, maybe we'll save that for Mr. Rasmussen. I think that's best addressed by John, yeah. Okay, and I also have a question about the proposed conditions of approval about the improvements to Delaney Road and Battle Creek. That's probably best for Mr. Rasmussen as well, is that right? Correct. Okay, so going on to C, um, that's that you have, uh, that there'll be adequate fire protection and other rural services are or will be available when the use is established. Um, the staff report says that um, that there was something from uh, the Turner Fire Department saying it's okay. Um, 
The district submitted, this is talking about the Turner Fire District, this is staff board says, the district submitted comments to the record regarding how existing and proposed facilities would need to comply with their requirements. Is, where is that in the, the Fox? I didn't see that. Um, there's, it should be in the file. Um, I can make sure that you that you okay. have it. Can yeah. you, could you summarize what they said since I, I, I didn't see it? Yeah, basically um, they proposed uh, multiple improvements uh, that would be required, um, mostly uh, dealing with, um, as I understand it, access um, issues, ensuring that there's adequate um, turnaround space for fire vehicles, um, as well as I think there were concerns potentially about the um, existing bridge crossing Battle Creek Road. Um, in addition, uh, there were um, need. There was a need for improvements uh, with uh, regards to sprinkling uh, systems, uh, fire safety systems inside of existing structures. That was one of my main questions. So, what is the, what is the, what what are they? Uh, what's the current? Do they have sprinkler systems in the existing things? Are they going to need sprinkler systems in the proposed things? And then, obviously, that brings up water requirements too. Right, um, I, I am not aware of what the current conditions are. Um, we can ask the applicant about that too. So. Okay. Okay, and so, and I noticed just for, again from just quickly glancing through Mr. Lean's submission, uh, he brought up some other, what, what other, um, other rural services are you considering? It looks like you address septic and water, I think that's it. I think he brings up like um, safety, like police, that kind of thing. And, and are there any other other rural services that you generally think need to be addressed? Uh, that covers what we um, staff uh, found needed to be addressed. Okay, so you don't think fire? I mean, I'm sorry, police needs to be addressed. Um, we did not uh, believe that uh, police needed to be addressed. All right, um, okay, and then here comes, I think like you said, the crux, getting to sub D, that's where we get into water. There, there are other things under sub D as well, but that, that's sort of the big one. Could you walk me through, I know you went over this a little bit, but could you sort of walk me through the water situation? So, or maybe correct me when I'm wrong when I go through it. So, they are entitled to exempt uses for, for domestic, they can have 15,000 gallons a day for domestic purposes and potentially 5,000 gallons a day for commercial use. Um, there's also that the half acre for irrigation, but I don't think that really, Correct. that doesn't, doesn't really affect what we do here, uh, probably. Um, so they basically have to use only 20,000 gallons per day. And you, don't, and you don't get to like bank it, like use 10,000 one day and get 30,000 the next, you, you get 20,000 a day, right? That is under our, our understanding, yeah, based on correspondence with the Oregon Water Resources Department. And so one of the things that is confusing to me is it's apparently I think they provide water to some neighbors as well. <laughs> That's probably the wrong use to a word to use. They also provide water to other neighbors. It is, um, it is a shared uh, public system, yes. And so that 20,000 gallons, do they get to 20,000 for them and then they can give another 15,000 to others? I don't think they do, right? Our understanding is that it's 20,000 for the system. Okay. Um, and do we know exactly how much they're giving to other folks? Because I didn't really see that. Uh, staff did not have a breakdown of that, no. Okay. Because it seems like even best case scenario for the applicants, they would have trouble with the expansion even if they used all the water themselves. So it seems, how are they going to, it seems we definitely need to like be figuring out how much they're giving to other people as well. Would, also, do you, you agree? We can ask the applicant about that when it's their turn, but yeah. just want to make sure we're on we, you, the staff sees it the same way. Correct, yeah. Okay, and then the one other thing I was confused about is there was, you, talk, you talked earlier about the discrepancy between some, some well logs, and I'm not exactly following exactly what's going on there. Yeah. Maybe if you could go through that in detail, that would be helpful. Sure, um, so in the uh, um, peer review of the hydrogeology review that was submitted um, to uh, the planning department, um, our peer reviewer, um, noted that there was a discrepancy between the well logs that were submitted as a part of the hydrogeology um, review and um, those that are um, listed in uh, the uh, Oregon Health Authority's drinking water system. 
um, basically that the, what they s said that they were um, using in a, a, according to um, the Oregon Health Authority's drinking water system uh, for drinking water um, and what um, the uh, hydrogeology review listed as the, the source wells were different. So were they, are you saying they used they were using the same wells and came up with different numbers for the same wells, or they were using different, different wells. wells. And so, what what is? I mean, I've read through all this, but so what was so Oregon Water Resource Department? So they're using different wells. Are they saying that the wells the applicant used were wrong, or they should have used different wells, or just? They questioned the results based on their wells. That's about what is the discrepancy? This was a lesser concern for staff. It was just uh, something that was noted in the peer review um, that they uh, that that discrepancy should be um, uh, fixed, basically. Okay. Um, I'll give you one last question. This um, and again, this is just from glancing through Mr. Lean's memo right before the the, the hearing. He's basically saying, well, I think we have to dismiss the whole case. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But he's saying that a lot of the, the proposed uses are not, I think what he's basically arguing is these aren't actually encompassed under the allowed conditional, potentially allowed conditional use. And in particular, the RV park and the ropes course. Apparently, he, he's, he states that the ropes course, they've actually, it's just it's a business. It's open to the public. That's not something you're allowed to do in the air zone. Um, you have a position, right? and I know this is this is just getting sprung on you the way it's getting sprung on me. So I understand if you don't have an answer, but um, do you have a position on the RV park and the potentially um, open to the public use of ropes courses? Um, no. Uh, so this uh, staff have discussed this, um, and I, I know the ropes course was approved through conditional use, um, and I believe it to be. Um, basically accessory to uh, the religious use of uh, the property. Um, the RV um, spaces, I don't, not all of the proposed RV spaces um, in the, uh, the, this proposal, um, but RV use was um, established in the um, uh, 1981 conditional use expansion. That's what I thought about the RV. So, but, but when the ropes course was approved, it wasn't approved as it was just an accessory use, something to use by the students. It's not some. It's different if it's open to the public, isn't it? Um, I would have to uh, speak with my director about that. Okay. All right. Um, again, sorry for bringing those on you. They, it's, it's okay. they just they just came in. Um, thank you. That's a great report. Appreciate it. Um, uh, again, we'll probably have questions for you on on staff rebuttal. But I think with that, we can turn it over to the applicant. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Ganderville. I am the attorney for the applicant. My address for notice purposes is PO Box 470, Salem, Oregon, 97308. The proposed development is an expansion of existing conditional uses that have been operating on the property through various approvals for approximately 40 years. Applicant has provided substantial evidence in the record demonstrating compliance with the majority of the criteria outlined in the code and will- well, Ms. Fanning, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I can see a lot of people are having trouble hearing, so. Okay. You know, I'm, yeah, these <laughs> microphones don't pick up very well, so everybody has to try to talk into them. I know it's hard with the mask. I'm, I'm not sure how good a job I'm doing as well, but I gotta stop saying it as well. That's the wrong <laughs> word to use in this case. At this point, the applicant is submitting our initial application with additional evidence submitted into the record through written testimony and proposing several proposed conditions of approval to ensure compliance where we are not demonstrating complete adherence to the code. With regards to water and traffic, we'll address those both in our written testimony already provided and through oral testimony today. At this point, I would like to introduce Samuel Mathias, who is the director of Salem Youth with a Mission, to discuss the general organization and the proposed expansion, and then we'll move through the rest of our um, presentation. Okay, great, thanks.
And again, we know who you are, but if you'll just give us your full name sure. and spell your last name, and then I'll, I'll swear you in. And your address, sorry. That would be great. My name is Samuel Matthias, uh, S-A-M-U-E-L-M-A-T-T-H-I-A-S. And I live at 7085 Battle Creek Road, Southeast. And, and do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're prepared to give will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I do. It's, it's Mr. Bolson? Uh, Wilson. Wilson, sorry about that. No problem. So hearing officer Wilson, um, neighbors, county staff, uh, and um, those who join us remotely, uh, Youth with a Mission is a non-profit, international, and multi-denominational Christian organization focusing on missions, training, local and global outreach, and mentoring young people. We've been in the neighborhood since 1978, and we have been serving the city and the county out of this address. It's on this physical campus that we gather young adults to mentor towards character growth and train them to be contributing members of society. Many young people today sadly find themselves confused, desperate, dismayed, and searching for hope. And I believe that's something that our county faces as well as a whole, not just young people. And hope is something we can offer through our ministries. Mayor Bennett just um, recently announced that we will have more refugees join our larger community. We visit those refugees in their homes and we have for a significant amount of time helping them to settle. We run ang anger management and addiction classes for inmates and the local prisons, providing counseling to them as well. We befriend Chemeca International students, being English-speaking friends, serve local youth groups, bridge minority groups and law enforcement, encourage groups, um, run encouragement groups for business leaders. I think what I'm trying to say, um, even responding to current crises like uh, the wildfires, being with volunteers down at the fairgrounds and, and um, sending them up the canyon to help with the cleanup efforts and after the ice storm, reaching out to our neighbors and sending neighborhood crews out into our own neighborhood on Battle Creek Road. We believe that our service to the city and to the county is now stronger than it's ever been for the last 42 years of being in this location. This is not because our hearts changed, it's because we grew and we see this project as a direct, um, in, in direct relation to it. We have always had the heart, heart to serve but with every additional person that we can have on the property, we can serve relevant needs in our community to a greater extent. Our hearts are in it and our lives are in it. And however this goes, we will continue to serve. But what is before you will directly impact the level at which we can and are allowed to do that. Aside from the long-term impact of attracting young, mature adults um, to the city of Salem, to, to the county, having them establish families, start businesses, and become members of society, every year these buildings that are before you will release hundreds of thousands of hours of mentoring and investment into young adults, and tens of thousands of hours of volunteer work in our city as every single staff, every single participant is directly volunteering in our county. And I, I just felt it was important to share this context of who is sitting before you today. We're not a commercial enterprise or institution. We're a nonprofit seeking to serve the youth and our community. We understand that there's neighborhood concern. And uh, frankly, we had not expected that level of opposition in 20, uh, 2017. I think that's on, on the record. And many, um, many valid concerns were raised back then, and we felt it was the most loving thing to take a, take a step back and honor those concerns by doing the research needed to find out if this project would bring harm to the community that we cherish. Um, you will find that we are empathetic to the neighbor's concerns and have done the best, to the best of our ability, address them in a matter of fact. And we have found that this will greatly, this project will greatly benefit and not harm the neighborhood and our county. And as these studies concluded, we have reached out to the neighborhood um, to facilitate uh, comments, questions, and feedback, and attempted to answer those to the best of our abilities. 
on the project itself, we're breaking it into four phases. The first phase beginning as soon as we hopefully have um, the permission to do so, and the final phase wrapping up the earliest in 2026. Uh, we don't have the funding secured for full build-out, so it will most likely take a lot longer than that. At full build-out, as it's before you, the proposed population of the campus would be a total of 406 students and on-site residents and the 90-day users that were referenced already. Our first phase hopefully will start soon and will include the upgrading of the existing infrastructure, focusing on limiting the impact to surrounding area to the surrounding area and include the much needed updates to water and septic systems. We also improve the existing internal roads, access and internal circulation and that was I think referenced by the earlier comments um, from, from Turner Fire Department. We plan on improving the entrance and add that new dormitory, new student housing um, with versatile use rooms to send and train more missionaries and, um, and uh, serve our county. The consolidation and expanding of the existing recreational vehicle sites to support volunteers focused on the training and support the mission as a whole. And then our later phases will include the rest that's before you of the renovation and replacement of several existing um, structures, on-site staff housing and existing offices. We're reusing existing structures where we can, but um, where we can, we will um, remove and replace that, uh, those structures that can't be re uh, retrofitted. I just wanna maybe in closing, thank you for your time and thank you for your, for your patience to allow me to share more of who we are um, as then the team will address the specifics um, of, of why we're trying to build. I understand that this is a matter of fact uh, process. But I would like to just reiterate that it's to serve more young people who in turn bring life to Marion County. And this is why we are trying to expand and, and seek your approval in this process. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So as to the rest of our presentation, I will be addressing um, applicants' burden of proof and um, the sensitive groundwater overlay and its interplay with this application. And then our engineer will respond to specific water feasibility questions and our traffic engineer will address the traffic questions you might have. Um, we wanted to reiterate that the applicable approval criteria for this application is confined to those criteria set forth in the AR zone conditional use process. Applicant has the burden of providing sufficient evidence in the record to show that it has satisfied this criteria. Generally, the AR zone is focused on the ability to provide services on a property for the proposed use, demonstrating that those can be contained and within the property and adequately serve the proposed use. In regards to your question regarding the rural nature of this use, the AR zone is a adopted zone and, and has been acknowledged by DLCD as a conditional use within that zone, this is per se a use that is permitted within the zone provided applicant can demonstrate compliance with the conditional use criteria. So we believe that the kind of harmony criteria is tied to being able to provide adequate public services for the proposed use. Um, Applicant has provided a proposed site plan, which in the Marion County code process is a general proposal for development on the subject property. Marion County doesn't have a site plan review process, and this document is meant to set out the general scope and location of the proposed development, which is why some of the more particular um, restrictions and standards that will apply to the development are not being discussed at this time. What applicant has provided and will continue to provide is 
evidence that it is working with service providers that will provide further detail as permits are pulled and construction begins. Applicant is prepared to meet all applicable standards and follow the county and the state's processes for this type of development. Applicant has already provided evidence that it has contracted with professionals that are following the required procedures for this type of development and that evidence has been submitted into the record. The applicable burden for this application is whether the applicant has provided substantial evidence in the record demonstrating that the proposed development complies with the code or will comply with the code upon the application of reasonable conditions of approval. As part of applicant's additional submittal, written submittal, and as part of this presentation, applicant has provided some proposed conditions of approval that would help address both staff and opposition's concerns as it, as it pertains to the applicable approval criteria. Applic applicants' representatives will provide additional testimony into the record further addressing these concerns and will be available to answer any of your questions. With regards to the sensitive groundwater overlay zone, we'd like to focus on the purpose of the zone. As further outlined in applicants' submittal, submittal and written statements, the purpose of the SGO zone is to implement the groundwater resource goals of the Marion County Comprehensive Plan. This chapter implements a program to review land use applications and assess the risks that a proposed use will adversely affect the sustainability of aquifer production within the specified overlay. The mechanism for this inquiry is a hydrological review process. Do the concerns voiced by applicants' opposition at the previous CUP hearing, applicant hired John Rehm, a licensed hydrogeologist to perform a hydrological review in line with the county's process. This hydrological review was went through the peer review process and was approved by a neutral third party selected by the county. The budget set forth in the hydrological review represents a maximum budget for water use in the area that won't showing that that level of usage won't impact the availability of water from the particular aquifer in the study area as defined in that report. Through this process, John Rehm determined and the peer reviewer agreed that the aquifer can sustain an increase in the water usage on the pro subject property for up to 342% of the current water usage, which would be a one-to-one -one increase of the current usage to the projected population on the property. However, applicant acknowledges and the peer reviewer noted that it doesn't currently have the legal right to use water at this rate. As established in the peer review letter, applicant is currently legally entitled under the statute to 20,000 gallons of water. This is significantly below the max maximum budget established by the hydrological review. An applicant is prepared to agree to a condition of approval capping water usage at the amount that it is legally entitled to use, whether under the exempt use statute or through the through obtaining an additional water right at some point in the future. Aren't the additional water rights that you can get limited to exempt uses, irrigation, and fire suppression? So you couldn't even get a water right for more domestic use? We're in discussions with OWRD at the moment, but we are under the impression that we could acquire an additional gen general use water right through transfer. You'd have to get it from somebody else, right? Yeah, okay. or through um, some type of additional process. But that is an ongoing process. As the peer review no noted, it can take up to a year. At this point, we are prepared to propose a conditional approval that caps at that 20,000 gallon limit, and our engineer will provide additional detail regarding how we would be able to do that feasibly. 
Um, regarding the mismatch in well records, our understanding is OHA has, just through a clerical error, has the wrong wells on file. The hydrological review was done using the appropriate wells and OWRD I didn't, has agreed that that's the case. Okay. Um, that will be fixed as soon as we can get a hold of someone at OHA. Um, Additionally, the, this is discussed further in our written statement. OWRD, in its covering of the general decline in the area, identified wells that were not within the study area, identified in the hydrological review. So it is likely true that there is generalized decline in the surrounding area. However, our hydrological review and the peer review lever letter didn't identify generalized decline as it pertains to our particular aquifer. And the hydrological review process is designed to allow for rebuttal of that generalized decline through this specific county established process. So as it pertains to availability of water, applicant has, has met its burden of proof um, and any attack on the final decision represented by the peer review letter is not relevant to this proceeding. Um, I'd like to hand it off to Mark Grimms who will address any engineering questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Trains Officer. My name is Mark Grimms. I'm with Multitech Engineering. Our office is at 1155 13th Street Southeast. We're the site and some of the site engineers and consultants for this project. Oh, and do you uh, swear or affirm that the testimony you're prepared to give will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thanks. So the, the water is, of course, a, a significant issue out here. And when um, Mr. Green, the hydrogeologist, was, was undertaking this, the, the youth with the mission group and our office met him, and we provided information, and they did, to him to try to make sure that his analysis was based on what was, at that time, characterized to be the, max, the worst case maximum number of residents that likely would be you know, his report references the numbers of people as students, but that those numbers actually represent students and staff together. But but anyway, they were that they were intended. So that he was using 130 as the as the base of total staff and students, and 450 for the total uh, expansion, maximum expansion. So. As the master plan that we have and that's been put into the record now has it, the, the projected maximum number of people that would be on site would be more in the around 206 people. But so that's what the that's what the discussion that I have is working from. The project site does provide water to some adjoining residential uses and. Although it's difficult, since there's, it's not metered, it's difficult to ascertain, but, but it's a, that would be in the 1,800 to 2,000 gallons per day in, in, in water that's, that's likely going to outside users outside of that. <clears throat> in, the, in his analysis, and he, he, there was a consumption well, in some sense, but there was production records for 2012 that noted that there was 19.35 acre feet of, of water, groundwater appropriated for the use, and, and, that's, a, and that's very high. Um, subsequent to that in 2016, they had uh, water uh, usage that was 8.67 acre feet, which um, was quite a bit lower than that. 
the, during that time frame in between 2015 and 2016, they, they the, the YRAM staff um, spent a great deal of time and found a significant number of leaks in their system and that the, those leaks were repaired and that likely is why the water consumption in 2016 is significant lower. That 19.35 acre feet would equate to something like close to 130 gallons per capita per day, which is which is very high, well beyond what we would use in a design in the design of, of water facility systems. For residential systems today, we use between 90 and 100 gallons per capita per day for for designing facilities, and that would be with a safety factor. Statistics today show that the that in most jurisdictions across this country that the per capita consumption down is today is down to 82 or 84 gallons per capita per day. And that includes, that's residential uses and including associated uh, irrigation, things that people would have with residential uses as, as well. So we would, we would believe that, that it's probably more likely to, that instead of using a median um, water extraction of the 14, uh, the 14 plus acre feet that, that he had, that it's more appropriate to be in the 10 to 11 acre feet. And that's, that's higher than the 2016 value, but there was some discussion that that, that year was drier, and so that supported why the, the production was lower it actually could be, you could use that same argument, say a dryer, so it's likely that production might have been slightly higher because if you associate residential uses that are connected to this, you use the water for irrigation or stuff, then they likely would have used more. But that's, <clears throat> that would be the basis for that. And if you use the, the current numbers, then we're gonna go from 130 to 406 was about, which is tripling, not quite the 346% that he had, but it's more like 300%. In order, in order for this facility to be able to have that increase in, in staff and students on site and to try to be able to um, stay within the, the uh, maximum amount of water that they're allowed by permit to extract, you would have to get the per capita water consumption down to, to between 37 and 38 gallons per capita uh, after you extract the other uses that the other homes have, which is which probably you wouldn't have any way to regulate or to control that. And then the then the the, the issue then would be is that achievable? And Seems and, like a long shot. And but I'll I'll give you some I'll give it so right now I believe that that if you if you assume that that facility that in the time frame was built that that facility uses utilizes standard fixtures there it's highly unlikely that there's that there's been much upgrading done in that facility and so you have standard fixtures if there if my numbers are correct then after you extract the 2000, they're using around somewhere in the 68 to 70 gallons per capita is what the consumption on that, <clears throat> in that. Just, just so I make sure I'm following you, are you saying that after giving the 1800 to 2000 gallons to the neighbors, then you would have to have all the people on site use 37 to 38 gallons per day? But, and, and, I, and I don't have this written out, but I will provide it in writing to you so you have it. So you don't have to remember all of my numbers here, but, um, but yeah, you'd have, to start, you'd have to start whittling it down to that. So then the question is, how would you and could you do that? And, and I believe that- basically less than half of what a standard usage is, right? For the average that, person. That's correct. So, but this, is, this facility doesn't generate the same types of uses that a, that a conventional single family residence would. That's, that's for sure because one, you don't have irrigation activities tied to it. Two, you, you have centralized laundry and centralized 
cooking for a lot of the facilities. And certainly that will be the case with the expansion with their dining hall and that kind of stuff. So if you, if you, if you took the effort to go back through the existing facilities and upgrade them, which, which Samuel said that they were planning to do, and you, t and you went through and, and changed out all the fixtures in there and, that the, and all the new fixtures that went in were low flow type fixtures there, I'll give you some examples of what kinds of changes that can make. So again, my presumption is that today, the water consumption that takes place is based on standard fixtures, no low, no volume flush toilets, it's just standard stuff. So a shower head, a typical standard shower head today uses, uh, discharges approximately five gallons per minute. A low flow, the, the current low flow systems that are available today, discharge at the rate of between two and two and a half gallons per minute. So if you split the difference, so that's a 55% reduction in, in, in flow. Low, low flush volume toilets today, a standard toilet flush volume is 3.6 gallons per flush. Low flows are designed for 1.6 gallons per flush. That's a 55% reduction in that. A typical faucet that you find in, in a residential environment today uh, will discharge at the rate of between 2.5 and 3 gallons per minute. Low flow fixtures are designed in, to set up to be to discharge at 1.5 gallons per minute, which is about a 45% reduction in, in volume. Now, if you, if you also carry this out and assume that in the, in the, in the centralized facilities that are gonna be there for dining and for, for other uses, and you use the, and you take the effort to put in the high, high efficient, low flow facilities that are there. Um, and this is, and, I, and I, the statistics I got were from, were again related more towards residential type fixtures, but just so that you have an example of what kind of efficiencies there are. A typical dishwasher that's, that's, that's utilized in a, in a household uses approximately 10 gallons per set. The, high, the new uh, low flow high efficiency uh, dishwashers have that down to about six gallons per set. So that's a 40% reduction. And clothes washers, the new clothes washers today that are set up to be more efficient. We used to, used to set out at 40 gallons per load are down into 25 gallons per load. So that's also a 40% reduction. So those are the, those, and those are real things that can be done. I mean, those are, this is not a, this is not an activity change. This is a, this is just a, take a conscious effort to put the, to put the facilities and build them with this type of equipment. There are activity things that people do that can, can also impact that. The amount of water that's consumed, they're, they're harder to control, but an example, and I, and I know this, from myself as well as my household. When you brush your teeth, you typically, you typically leave the water run while you're brushing your teeth. That activity um, would consume uh, about eight gallons of water in a time if a person brushes their teeth the way they're supposed to. Now, not, my kids never did that, but that's, that said. So if you can, if you, well, excuse me, I, wrote, I said that wrong. If you turn the faucet off, if you wet your toothbrush, you turn the faucet off, you would save between six and eight gallons of water during that time frame. So that's roughly 7% of what, of what a residential household consumption is per capita per day. So that's, so that's, a, that's a significant reduction. So, if you could achieve a 40 to 45 percent overall reduction in water consumption on this facility, you'd have the potential to get pretty close. You wouldn't quite be there with that, but but I think there's other ways that you could do that, and I think that that it demonstrates that it's possible to do. Now, if you take into take into consideration then the the conditions that that 
our group is putting forth in terms of monitoring water consumption. And that, and that Sam pointed out that this facility is gonna be built in, in phases. I think there'd be an opportunity to, to relatively easily determine whether or not as they've added added facilities and if they've added people to this that that they are or aren't achieving the goals that need to be set out in order to be able to stay within the limits that that, that they legally have to without having to go out and, and find a way to acquire additional water rights so that's the and like I said, I'll put this all in writing for you so you have it, because it's like I said, it's a little dis, disjointed in how I've said it here, but I do have that and I'll document a little bit better the basis for my assumption on how much goes off-site in there. But the, it, I used my, the same principles I would use if I was designing a water supply system for a residential structure or for, I mean, for apartment structure or subdivision, the same parameters. So I'll, that'll be the basis for how I get that. And I did, and this information I quoted, I did pull it off of some statistics off of that are available out there from nationally for, for water consumption and savings for low flow. So it, it, they are real, They're, they weren't just made up by me. The other aspect that I wanted to, to, to talk to you is about stormwater, because I know that that's also something that people are in that area are concerned about. And flooding is always, along Battle Creek is always an issue that people are concerned about. So I've been, I've been a member of the uh, Marion County Water Quality Advisory Board since, it's, since it's, it was set up about seven or eight years ago. And that board has been, that has been assisting Marion County in the development of its, of its stormwater quality and quantity uh, standards that are used to, to help them meet their MS4 permit that DEQ has set out for them to meet. And at the present time, they're modif they're, those standards are being upgraded to be to the new requirements of their of their latest permit that are going to that are going to include some fairly significant quali quality upgrades as well as quantity controls. In the master plan that was provided, there was some water, some wa stormwater treatment and detention ponds that were shown on the site plan. Our office has ha helped and put that together, and it, and we believe that that we can those facilities can be designed so so as to maintain water quality to meet the current standards and as well as the new standards that Marion County is going to have for water quality for discharges from from new hard surface in a facility like this, as well as being able to provide stormwater detention and up to and through a 100-year event on that site outside of the floodway and be able to do it in a manner so as to doubt so that that the downstream properties don't see any real increase in runoff from this project from that standpoint so th those are achievable we do that a lot now um, most every jurisdiction has it Marion County's catching up with their MS4 permit and and most jurisdictions like city of Salem and other biggest are already there. Um, that's, that's my part of this. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have of me right now. Like I said, I'll put this all in writing for you, so. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I think I'll probably just, there's gonna be a whole lot of stuff coming in, so I'll just, oh, hopefully all the submissions will answer any questions I have, so uh, thank you. You betcha. And again, as part of our additional written comments, those proposed conditions of approval are focused not only on providing more efficiency, but also providing that metering that shows compliance with the legal limits. Um, and those uh, we're prepared to discuss those conditions of approval with staff and kind of flush them out as necessary. Marion County has applied similar metering requirements to uses kind of along these lines in the past. Um, the next on our list is our traffic engineer and she'll address the proposed condition of approval along with a proposed alternative condition. Before, before you go, since yeah. this might be a legal issue too. So um, this, it looks like the staff report is suggesting that you guys pay a proportionate share of a 
a, basically a major re-improvement project. And if I understand you guys correctly, you just want to put in, you don't want to do that. You'll, you'll pay your sheriffs like some minor like stop signs and warning things and stuff like that, right? Um, we have, again, we're flexible on that condition itself. If, um, if they would rather have a monetary contribution equal to our proposed mitigation, we can explore that. But at this point, we believe that our impact on the traffic system is fully mitigated by those proposed mitigation measures. And we also believe that we don't have a proportionate share contribution to that particular intersection. Yeah, and if I, if I recall, isn't the, wouldn't the, the anticipated share they were, the engineering was saying you'd be on the hook for was $220,000 or something like that? It was a revise, we've revised it on, pertaining to this revised TIA so that the estimate is closer to 11,000 now. Oh, it's only 11,000? Yes. Oh, okay, well, that is a big difference, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a big difference. Um, and Lacey can kind of outline her methodology regarding those. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Lacey Brown with DKS Associates. Uh, my last name is Brown, like the color, B-R-O-W-N. Uh, my address uh, for our office is 117 Commercial Street, Southeast, Salem, Oregon, 97301. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're prepared to give will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. All right, thanks. Yes. Um, as our traffic study indicated, uh, the impacts from this expansion in terms of number of trips and its impact on the transportation system, um, it does not create any deficiencies or significant impacts to the transportation system. All of these study area intersections currently operate within Marion County standards and will continue to do so. Uh, we actually evaluated the peak day event, so you know the couple days a year where everybody would come, arrive on campus, and then the days when they would leave, that would generate the highest level of traffic. Uh, that is what we analyzed, so we are looking at a peak day condition and we will still operate. Yeah, so a number of the opponents were claiming that you guys didn't take into account their special events, and so by peak days, that's what you mean, the special events, right? Correct, yeah, and, so and the, the peak, or the, some of the special events um, would likely happen on a weekend when background traffic and typical commuter traffic is much lower. Um, so standard practice for an, analyzing traffic impacts is during the peak hour of the roadway, not necessarily the peak hour of the use. Um, so if you add in a weekend um, event to, on a weekend day's background traffic, it's typically going to be lower than during a commuter rush hour and adding on use trips at that point. If I recall, none of the, uh, even on the peak days, none of the facilities were I think, worse than level C, is that right? Correct, yes. So level of service C it was the um, worst level of operations and the Marion County standard is level service E. So there is substantial capacity remaining um, even during those peak conditions. Okay. Um, so because of that, uh, typically a proportionate share to a project in Marion County is triggered by an operations deficiency, either an operations deficiency that exists or that the project is um, triggering that deficiency. Um, and no such case uh, exists for this project. Uh, there are some safety related deficiencies in the area that we've identified where historically there's been more crashes than we would expect for that type of intersection. And so our proposal is to actually put in some interim uh, safety improvements. Uh, as Margaret mentioned, we could pr provide a, a, a proportionate share of this larger project that is you know, several years down the road before that would get implemented. Um, our proposal is to actually pay the full price of these short-term interim improvements that could be put out in the field in a couple weeks, potentially, and improve safety um, in the interim at the uh, Delaney Road and Parish Gap intersection. All right. Uh, thank you. Sure. And uh, oh, before you go, I just, yes. again, um, if you're following along, so the, the opponent's attorney has submitted like a, a lengthy memorandum today that I just kind of glanced through, and I think 
one part I noticed, he was claiming that you did not take into account, I think it was a 90 day users in the TIA. Do you want to address that now or are you going to wait to address that in the, during the open record period? Or? Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at that comment, so I'll be sure to address it um, yeah. in writing after this. That'd be great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, I think the only outstanding comment was re potentially related to um, your questions about the Turner Fire District comments. We're working with Turner Fire District on providing some supplemental updates to our proposed site plan that show conformance with the issues that they address. We have been working on, with them kind of through this full application process and um, we believe that we'll be able to incorporate most, if not all of their suggestions. Okay. So you'll, you'll have something from them saying that they, they're okay with your proposal instead of saying, I think that'd be better than having something saying we're going to work with them and get it worked out because if there's um, issues about whether you can. Yes. The comments that they submitted into the record were just, were the typical comments that focus on applicant needing to be able to meet all of the applicable fire code standards. So we'll work with them to get a revised comment. Okay. Um, if you have any other questions of the applicant at this time, we can address them or I think that concludes our presentation if you okay. don't. Okay. Yeah, hold on. I think Mr. Rasmussen wants to talk. Um, why don't you come up? But I do have one more question for you just under the other approval criteria. Um, so under subsection A about, uh, I, I was talking to Mr. Dyer about this. So when you're talking about being in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zone, um, how do you read that third sentence of the purpose um, provision? We read it as being confined to the, the ability to provide the public services that the county doesn't provide in these rural residential settings. When you read the goals and the um, policy sections of the comprehensive plan as it res relates to this implementing zone and other re rural residential zones. The focus is on this ability to provide necessary services so that you are containing your impact on the surrounding area. We believe by, that by demonstrating our ability to provide adequate septic, storm water, and water for the proposed use that we meet that rural residential standard, um, which is what that sentence in particular addresses. Again, as a conditional use in the zone and without kind of those maximum lot um, usage criteria or density restrictions in the area, those there isn't any standard requiring a conditional use to conform to standards that are otherwise presented in the code as a requirement. I think without including those requirements here, there's no intent for the county to restrict the type of usage based on density on the lot. And so I, I take it you, um, some of the other opponents, uh, they've uh, thrown out that it, it does, the application doesn't comply with provisions of the comprehensive plan or the goals. I take it your position is that the comprehensive plan and the goals don't apply to this, is that right? Yes, um, because it is an established conditional use in an acknowledged comprehensive plan and zoning structure, the statewide planning goals have already been implemented as it pertains to this particular zone and any conditional uses permitted under the code. Um, I think population itself on a conditional use doesn't necessarily indicate whether or not it's a rural use. You look at large farm operations and the commercial uses that are run in conjunction with them and the density, population density is, um, exceeds what you would expect to see for that use in the zone. It's the reason we have a conditional use process to allow for specific uses that are specified provided they meet the conditional use standards that the code provides. Again, density 
and lot coverage is in a criteria. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think I mentioned a number of those things that I just quickly saw Mr. Lean raising, but I assume you'd just rather address those in your during open record period. Yes, I haven't had a chance to look through it yet. All right. All right, thank, thank you. you. And so that's, that's everybody from your team, right? Yes, we'll reserve some time for rebuttal. Okay. All right, great. Okay. Just to make sure there's nobody who snuck in without me noticing who wants to testify in favor of the application. Okay, great. And Mr. Rasmussen, you wanted, did you want to talk now? Okay, why don't you come on up? Hi, John Rasmussen, County Land Development. And um, I'm just here, I'm just here kind of as a general spokesperson for, um, in terms of one aspect, that would be traffic. And um, I, I, I don't know uh, if, if there's um, some uncertainty or confusion uh, about the uh, project uh, that is mentioned in um, our revised memo. Actually, it's the same, the same project was in our previous memo up, updated memo is still there. And uh, so uh, our transportation planner reviewed the current 2020 TIA. Um, a former employee reviewed the, two, the 2017 TIA. Uh, the project that we reference uh, down at Delaney is a bridge replacement and realignment, complete realignment of two intersections there. It's not just signing and striping. Now, signing and striping would be a good interim uh, treatment for that, and, and that's, um, uh, that's very generous of the applicant to uh, offer that. But the project that, um, that I'm referencing in Condition A, proposed Condition A, that is, um, of our memo, is, um, like I say, it's a bridge, bridge replacement and a realignment of two intersections. And I have, um, actually have an exhibit with me, and I, d I don't know if uh, Ms. Brown has has that, but um, I can I can get her a copy. Um, but if I may, I can submit this in. Sure. And, and and this exhibit is a preliminary drawing only, um, and it was provided to me along with a cost estimate provided to me by our transportation planner. And the, the estimated cost on this project is $3.85 million. And so the proportional share that is, is mentioned in, in our proposed Condition A references this project. And so do we know, it, is it, the proportional share is 11000 around there, is that right? Or? I, I don't know, because I, I did not review the TIA myself. What I can tell you, what I can tell everyone is that um, I have I have in writing from our uh, transportation planner um, that um, she has no real issues with the TIA, um, meaning that she's you know notwithstanding any um, added incidental traffic that might need to be added, uh, that she was okay with the with the, with the uh, trip generation and the distribution. Now that and that's is that on the record. You said you have it in writing. I, I have an email from, from her to okay. me uh, saying that she has no issues with the TIA. Okay. And that, is that email on the record? I don't know. Uh, the email is dated 319.21 at 10 to 26 a.m. and I can submit that. Okay. Yeah, why don't we get that in just, just in case? There's, there's sure. all sorts of stuff, so I'm not sure. And, and as I mentioned, I'm just kind of here as a general spokesperson. Um, you know, there, there may be some there may be some clarifying that we need to do on the side in the open record period about this. Um, so I can't I can't confirm that eleven thousand is because I wasn't I wasn't not the reviewer of that TIA. I can't confirm that that eleven thousand is for the for the same thing that she's talking about and, and I'm talking about. We're, two, we're talking about two different things, maybe. So. Um, I think that will just need to be uh, uh, worked out. So, so just out of curiosity, when you when you talk about proportionate share, who else do you 
build a proportionate share of when you're doing this improvement? It would be um, uh, any significant contributor to the project. In other words, uh, uh, significant addition of traffic. So that could be, if, if there's not any other project of recognizable size in the area uh, coming online, then, then there would be no other contributor. So you only apply that when somebody files an application for some sort of development. Like you're not going to bill everybody in the room, right, for their proportionate share, right? Not, unless they want to visit visit the property. <laughs> right. There's, there's, it's not I'm like an kidding. LID kind of thing where. No, you're, I'm just kidding. Um, no, we don't we don't bill anybody else. Well, so my question is then, this isn't a thing where the assuming their traffic impact analysis is fine, um, it's not. There's not a capacity problem. So this, this is an existing dangerous intersection, it, th This is a safety project. Right, and the, the applicants didn't create the safety problem, and if they're not increasing it past capacity, they're not making the safe, they, why, why, is, why are they unhooked to fix it? Well, because they're adding, they're adding traffic to it, and it's just, it, it's simply um, um, the uh, uh, fraction of the traffic they are increasing by but it's not. It's not the amount of traffic that makes us dangerous. It's the. It's the, the state of the intersection. It's just dangerous roads. It's, it's not just. It's just adding traffic, traffic to it. If, um, it's just adding traffic. Com the amount of traffic they're adding, the increase compared to the background traffic in the area. So it's it's that, that that's where the proportion comes in. So it's not just about level of service and operations. It's some projects are capacity, some are safety. This is a safety project. Right. But if I understand that, but if I understand your whole proportion thing, but if they're not the ones who made it dangerous and they're not the ones who are making it dangerous, why, why is it their responsibility to fix it just because they want to develop the property? Well, um, they, they aren't uh, solely responsible to fix it. They're just contributing a small fraction of their contributing traffic to it. And why are they responsible? Uh, because under the conditions criteria, we look at infrastructure requirements. That's that's. I mean, it's, yes, it's very general in the in the zone code. It's very, there's a, there's a one there's one paragraph about conditions criteria and meeting uh, infrastructure improvements or infrastructure uh, requirements. And um, this is this is uh, this is the link we're making through the conditional use process. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so now I think we turn to opponents. And why don't we start? I know Ms. Childers was the first one here. She's not the first one on the list, but why don't we have her come up first? And again, before, oh. These are some additional submissions. Oh, okay. Thank you. And then again, before, before we get on to the, uh, the opponent's testimonies, um, again, this is going to be here while we've got a lot of folks, so we'll try to keep it to five minutes per person. And something I should point out, I think I mentioned this to a few of the people beforehand, but um, once an issue gets raised, I have to address the decision if, it, if it's applying to the, the approval criteria. So if somebody says there's a lot of traffic, it, it, that issue's raised and I have to address it. So it doesn't make it any better or any worse of an argument if 10 people, you know, one person says there's a lot of traffic or 100 people say there's a lot of traffic. Same thing with water. It's like if somebody says, oh yeah, it's gonna make water go down. When somebody says it, I have to address it. It doesn't help to have 20 people say water's gonna go down. If you have specific testimony about your property, that's one thing, but just having some, the same people, or having different people making the same argument doesn't make it any better or any worse. So I'm just sort of encouraging people, if somebody says what you wanted to say and you agree with it, you don't have to go back and, and repeat what they said. Um, so with that, Ms. Childers, maybe you uh, can begin. And um, again, um, if you ever want to give us their full name, spell your last name, your address, and then I'll swear you in. My name is Carolyn Childers, C-H-I-L-D-E-R-S. My address is 6336 Mahalo Drive, Southeast Salem. 
And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're going to give will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes. All right, thank you. Please go ahead. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, our attorney Wallace Lean has uh, in his memorandum of opposition includes several objections to jurisdiction. It looks to me like those, I had a chance to look at those quickly. He's basically saying that, that some of the things they're asking for as a conditional use aren't actually potential conditional uses. So not that we shouldn't be here at all. He's, he's basically just arguing that they're asking for things that they're not even, that they're not even allowed to get. So uh, I'm not going to dismiss well, the case. It, 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 it may also be the case that they are not allowed to get, uh, to have a conditional use uh, considered if they are in current violation. That's right, that's another one. So that'd be something the applicant will have to address whether right. or not they're in violation. That's right. What was that, was that the only question at the moment? Yeah, yeah, okay. thank you. All right, uh, as I said, my name is Carolyn Childers and I live on Mahala Drive Southeast in Salem. My husband and I have lived there for 27 years and we intentionally sought property in a rural residential setting so we could have peace and quiet and elbow room without lots of people and traffic unless we ventured into the city. Before we purchased our property, we had a realtor provide information about the zoning so we knew what was and was not allowed. We have acreage residential zoned parcels on three sides of us and a farm parcel on one side. I am on the board of directors of Rural Battle Creek Road Association, Inc., which is an all volunteer organization that has been active in the neighborhood since our founding 16 years ago. We try to inform residents about topics that are relevant to the rural area where we live, including sending emails about cougar sightings, crime, why people should not feed the wild turkeys, and all types of similar subjects. We also mail out newsletters, uh, a few of them recently, recent years. One had the headline, Crucially Important Maintenance Task for Rural Homeowners. That was an in-depth article about septic system maintenance. Another had the headline, Fire Chief says now is the time to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildland fire in our neighborhood. In that article, we included information about the prevention of wildland fires, which the fire chief was very concerned about, and we provided detailed instructions to sign up for alerts through the MedCom 911 system. That was particularly relevant because we published it a year before the terrible wildfires in Western Oregon. Our entity's name tells our story. We emphasize rural, we emphasize the waterway Battle Creek, we emphasize Battle Creek Road. All components of our name reflect neighborhood characteristics which are important to us. Every key element of the proposed YWAM expansion conflicts, conflicts with our rural priorities. It would result in 21 times greater headcount per acre than the surrounding rural residential neighborhood. Hundreds of paved parking spaces included a giant parking lot for 110 vehicles adjacent to our namesake roadway would contaminate the aesthetics of our rural area. DEQ estimates sewage flow of tens of thousands of gallons per day on a site with a year-round waterway and severe flooding events. Our organization believes that zoning integrity is essential to reduce or avoid conflicts. It's hard to imagine anyone could conclude that an enterprise which could house as many as 
461 residents plus 90 day users is appropriate on an AR zone site. Ms. Tilders, and, and you might not be the one to answer this, but you might relay this to Mr. Wien. Um, as we, earlier we were talking about trying to decide, when we're talking about character of the rural community or compromising the, the rural community, whether that means just the water supply and wastewater disposal or if that means just like uh, population and density kind of thing. And so you might ask Mr. Lee, um, as it turns out, uh, Mr. Lee was the hearings officer who approved their 1981 permit. And when he was addressing that, that, um, that standard, um, I think the numbers were a little different than the code, but the, the same language. And he talked about, this is quoting from his decision, the purpose and intent of the AR zone is primarily to provide for acre tome sites. Each parcel must be able to provide for an adequate water supply and wastewater disposal system. That's kind of the sense I'm honing in on. That will not, see, will not exceed the environmental capabilities of the area or compromise the rural character of the area. The church-related facilities were contemplated in the AR zone. And here's, here's the, the key sentence. So this, is, this is him addressing whether it's in harmony with the purpose and intent. He says, provided that the water and sewer capabilities are sufficient on the parcel to accommodate the buildings and higher density population, this expansion will be, will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of the AR zone. So it seems to me that he sort of agrees with my understanding that you really, all you're looking at is that the water and the wastewater disposal. And if you are okay on that, you don't have to look at the density or how many people are there, that kind of thing. So I don't expect you to answer that right now if you don't want to. I, but you might point that out to Mr. Lean. And yeah, I, de I definitely that. will. And I think he'll very clearly lay out why it isn't solely the criterion that are listed as far as the um, physical aspects, the groundwater, the uh, roadways and whatnot. But I'll let him articulate that better. Because I saw um, that in the thing, he, what you handed me this morning or this afternoon, his submission, it seems to be at odds with what he said earlier. So I just wanted to see if we get his position on why, why it's different now. I'll, 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 I'll let him explain that. But one of the things that I think you need to be aware of, and I'm not sure if you are, in 1980 and 81 conditional use applications, the applicant clearly maintained that their uh, mission was to train agricultural missionaries to go out and train people in the world on farming practices. And as we can piece together from the actual record of the past cases, that lasted a very short time. But I believe if you look at the actual applications in 80, 81 timeframe, um, there was b basically a declaration by the applicant that that's, that was their intent. That's how they were gonna use the land. There was the, aura of rural reasonableness of fit with the neighborhood, fit with the area. And uh, that certainly isn't the case anymore because uh, even though they show drip fields on the uh, site plan, no, those drip fields have nothing to do with irrigation, uh, agriculture. So you're saying back then they were, they were training missionaries to do agricultural work around the world and they're not doing that anymore. They're, they have, that's correct. So I, I will let him uh, address that in more detail, but it's, there, there, there is a limit to, even if you have groundwater available and maybe uh, roadway available, would you think that, for instance, a use, just to, to throw something out, that was just half parking, parking lots over the whole property, would you, would you say because there's adequate water, maybe there's adequate roadway that uh, 31 acres, I'm not saying this is what they are proposing, but 31 acres of covered with parking spaces would be a fit with a rural area. And I think the answer is no. So obviously there's an element of this that has something beyond the, cri the criteria of just traffic and water and just going down the list. Um, but I'll, I'll let him from a legal standpoint address that more clearly. Um, I would like to enter f four more submittals into the record. You already have our opposition memo. And in the folder I just gave you, 
uh, have a letter from our president, uh, John, uh, known as Pat Gallagher, who's unable to attend today. I have a submittal regarding problems with the applicant's disclosure of water well and creek locations on their site plan. I have a submittal uh, regarding groundwater in general. And lastly, a submittal regarding the substandard road shoulders along Battle Creek Road in our entire neighborhood. First, the 31-page submittal by our attorney covers many topics, including many that I will not address in my remarks. Second, the letter from our president emphasizes the intent of the acreage residential zone, which is the zoning of most of the home sites in our neighbor, neighborhood, as well as the YWAM parcels. He expresses other concerns as well. Third, the sub submittal titled Locations of Water Wells and Creek presents the applicant's site plan, which is required by ordinance to show where the water wells are located, but not a single well is on their site plan. On a separate drawing in the applicant's report about the proposed septic system, one well is shown next to the entrance road on the east side of the creek, and another one is shown on a neighbor's parcel on the south southwest side of YWAM. A drawing in the applicant's hydrogeology review specifically shows an outline labeled YWAM campus and shows two wells located within the campus boundaries. The site plan submitted by the applicant in their 2017 case does not show either of those two well locations, but instead shows a well adjacent to the depicted flood zone on the west side of the creek. That well has apparently disappeared, although we could find no record at Oregon Water Resources Department that the well had been abandoned. It's curious and troubling that a feature so integral and important to living in a rural area is shrouded in such mystery or confusion. Fourth, our submittal titled Groundwater Information prevent, presents corrections to the applicant's hydro review and includes supplemental data to better understand the groundwater situation in our neighborhood. It's important to understand that the, the hydro review did not mention anything about the construction details of the YWAM wells. The two disclosed wells are 62 years old and 57 years old. They do not meet current state construction standards. Marion County Environmental Health Department noted in its water system survey in 2019 that the construction of both wells is inadequate. OWRD comments express concern about the seal. Our hydrogeologist describes the wells in detail based on the original well logs and catalogs the potential ramifications. The, applicant, the application asserts that the wells, quote, tap into an aquifer, not Battle Creek. In fact, per comments from OWRD and from our hydrogeologists, the wells tap into multiple aquifers, and they also suspect likely hydraulic connection to Battle Creek. Oregon Administrative Rules OAR 690-200 through 690-240 dictate well construction standards to protect aquifers from commingled water and to protect the watershed and the health of residents. The applicant has not provided any evidence that their well can be reconstructed to meet these standards. And if they were successfully reconstructed to prevent the commingling of water, and the potential hydraulic connection to the creek. 
could the wells then supply the amount of water required by YWAM? Without answering these questions, the applicant has not satisfied the conditional use approval criterion regarding adequacy of groundwater. The applicant's hydro review says that YWAM distributes piped water to four off-site homes. Greg DeBlace at Marion County Environmental Health Department told me in February that seven off-site homes are connected to the system. This discrepancy needs to be reconciled since all water used by the YWAM system must fall under the exempt allocations explained in OWRD's comments to the record. Our submittal includes a sampling of static water level readings from the quarter mile radius around YWAM. They show a substantial decline over the years, confirming comments by OWRD and our hydrogeologist about declining water levels in monitoring wells. And let me stress this, monitoring wells that they say are in the same aquifers as YWAM wells. They are not separate aquifers, they're the same aquifers. Our hydrogeologist stated, the source of water in the YWAM wells is shown to be part of the same groundwater flow system as the neighboring wells. Our hydrogeologist goes on to say, the groundwater flow system in the vicinity of YWAM is already in some distress as evidenced by declining water levels at OWRD observation wells. At the time, and this is a key point, at the time the applicant's hydro review was prepared, which was 2018, it said that YWAM was pumping 18,000 gallons of water per day. This is long after they say that they fixed the water leaks. If the YWAM site, site contained the current five acre default minimum home site parcel size, which is allowed in the SGO sensitive groundwater overlay zone, instead of their current facilities, there could be six home sites on their 31 acres. Marion County presumes each household uses 525 gallons per day. So that would only amount to 3,150 gallons compared to the 18,000 gallons per day that YWAM acknowledged in their hydro review that they were actually pumping. If YWAM increases that usage by 342% as they propose, then their water use would increase to 61,560 gallons per day. We oppose any expansion to YWAM since the water use is already excessive when compared to the normal presumed use in the AR zone. Our, our last submittal is titled Substandard Road Shoulders Along Paddle Creek Road. It provides details about Marion County's current engineering standards for Battle Creek Road. The standard, as I understand it, and I'm not an engineer, uh, but I do lay out in attachments, it requires five, or the standard is for five foot wide, nearly level gravel shoulders. It specifies only a three inch grade over the entire five foot span. I've included photographs of some of the shoulders in our area. I couldn't safely photograph the worst areas because the shoulders are so narrow and steep that there was no place to safely stand since many vehicles fly through the neighborhood at 55 miles an hour. Frankly, most of the lineal feet of shoulders along Battle Creek Road in our neighborhood between Wiltsey Street and Delaney Road not only do not meet current standards, but they are seriously deficient. A criterion of conditional use approval is for the adequacy of the roadway. This roadway is certainly not adequate for safe pedestrian use along its length. 
the county should not approve expansion of a facility which can accommodate 551 people, including hundreds of young people, when they cannot safely walk north or south along Battle Creek Road. Lastly, I'd like to cover deficiencies, gross deficiencies, deficiencies with the site plan. And I'm gonna run through them quickly. It's gonna sound like a little muddled, but I wanna make sure it's on the record. In spite of setback requirements from the massive leach fields, no water wells are shown on the plan. In this particular case, that lack of dis disclosure is especially troubling because the construction of the two disclosed water wells makes them susceptible to bacterial contamination. As noted in the Oregon Health Authority's survey results, which I've attached to my submittal, we presume that is also the case for the phantom third well, which somehow disappeared since 2017. The site plan does not indicate if existing septic fields will be retained or abandoned. The flood zone does not appear to be properly depicted as will be mentioned by other testimony or submittals to the record. Battle Creek is not shown on the northwest corner of the site plan, even though other sources seem to indicate that it curves back towards the proposed RV park. No building elevations, no heights, no number of stories, no maximum occupancy per building are provided on the site plan. DEQ told my fellow board member that the population figures were provided by the applicant, but we have no way to determine if those figures are consistent with the buildings on the drawing. If the applicant plans to build something which exceeds the maximum height allowed in the AR zone, we wouldn't know it until after construction. They could just say their master plan was approved and go get a building permit. Some neighbors, especially gardeners, thought the drip fields shown on the site plan were perhaps for some type of vegetable crop. So we had to explain they are for le septic leach fields, really big septic leach fields. In fact, they are a special type that can sometimes be placed in shallower trenches than standard leach fields, so they could be more susceptible to accidental damage by future landscape or construction work. My final topic regards the lack of disclosure, we believe, about headcount at special events. The applicant is known to host special events which purportedly attract hundreds of people. We did not find any disclosure about how many extra people are expected to be on site on these days, nor how many people and cars will visit the assembly hall, what time of day, and how often. These headcount numbers certainly are not reflected in the 90 day user total provided by the applicant to the DEQ. Regarding road safety, was any consideration given to the possible need for a tur turning lane to accommodate these special events? Will events be held in the evening at the assembly hall? How will attendees turn in and out without impacting the safety of, of other users on the roadway? Since these questions about the maximum anticipated headcount on any given day have come up in past cases and never been adequately answered, we believe it is reasonable to request that the disclosure occur at this public hearing. Since there is testimony in the record of past YWAM cases that soap suds float down Battle Creek Road, Battle Creek, the day after these special events, it is prudent to know these numbers now, not later. We value the characteristics of our rural residential neighborhood. We believe that upholding the integrity of the rural residential zone is important. Allowing an, an enterprise 
which can facilitate 21 times higher headcount per acre than the surrounding home parcels is unacceptable. No expansion should be allowed and the application should be not denied. We request discussion at the appropriate point in these proceedings uh, for a continuance to extend the open record period consistent with ORS 197.7636A. We have carefully prepared all our submittals to the best of our ability and I believe the information we have provided is accurate. And I do want to just quickly address a few things that, that have come up so far in the proceedings and I admit that uh, it's difficult to understand every word of the testimony because of the, the masks and uh, uh, my hearing aids. Uh, but I believe, so I, I, I might not have heard everything perfectly. No, um, I, I, I'm letting you go a lot longer since you're sort of repre okay. representing the, the, the group. Is this the kind of thing that can maybe just be submitted during the open record period? Uh, and we'll talk, and we'll talk at, the, yeah, the, the, at, the, the, at the very the, end of the hearing, we'll talk about the open record period and how, we'll, how that will work. Okay. One thing I'd like to emphasize sure. is the reason this total maximum headcount on any given day in the year is important is because when they say their water use can be controlled by all these methods, one thing that needs to be considered is by the, the very nature of their um, facility, people are there for the most part 24 hours a day. And in most households, you have kids going to school in normal years. You have people going to work. So they aren't there 24 hours a day. So this facility can't easily be compared to just a normal household. That's one thing to keep in mind. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. And again, we'll, we'll talk about the open record period at the end. Um, I'm just going to go down the list of the folks I have here. So is, is Robert Edgar here? Why don't you come up? And I, I let Ms. Childers go a lot longer than the five minutes because she's representing the, the, the neighborhood association. But we've got a lot of folks. It's already starting to get late. I know everybody would like to talk, might want to talk more, but we're going to really have to stick to the five minutes because it's, it's sort of not fair to the people who go last if, if everybody else gets to use a bunch of time and then everybody's just dying to get out of here when the last people talk. So. We're trying to make it fair and have everybody have their five minutes. I'll try to keep it short. Okay, thank you. And so again, Mr. Ash, you could give us your full name, spell your last name, your address, and I'll swear you. Yes, I am uh, Robert Edgar. Uh, uh, last name is spe uh, spelled uh, E D G A R at 3326 Deer Lake Court. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're prepared to give will be true to the best of your knowledge? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, uh, just to let you know that uh, I, I am retired. I used to work for the Oregon Department of Transportation as, a, as an engineer. Uh, what I want to start off here with is uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, summarize, uh, highlight what I just handed you. Um, that. Why I'm here is uh, to represent a lot of the uh, people that are in our neighborhoods. Um, they are very, uh, I think, open to the rural setting that we are in, um, low populations. And uh, some of the concerns that they have now is, you know, whether or not there is going to be a significant increase in the population density. And of course, this is from what uh, Youth with a Mission is uh, <laughs> going to be could be doing. Uh, they're also concerned about you know all the parking space, new parking spaces that are going to be appearing there. Um, there may be bigger and taller buildings, but we don't have all the information. Um, we weren't provided the, the square feet or how many stories there were, or how many people are going to be in the story in this uh, each uh, building. Uh, so there's a lot of inf information that hasn't been provided to us. Um, 
Uh, also, as has already been talked about uh, quite frequently today already, is that, uh, you know, they're concerned about, you know, uh, water usage and also, you know, septic runoff. So those are some areas that they're concerned about. Uh, getting started here, um, the, uh, the neighborhood that is adjacent to Youth with a Mission, um, I put together here a summary of uh, what it is. Uh, right now, there, this represents uh, over 400 acres of surrounding properties, and on these 400 acres, there's 128 homes. And what that means is that each home has about uh, a little over three acres per home. So uh, that's kind of keeping us as a rural area. And with that, uh, what that means is that the density uh, per person, um, that's estimating that we have about 316 people on these 400 acres, and that's based on a, an average number of uh, 2.47 people per home um, for Oregon. Uh, that would represent um, uh, 316 people on the 400 acres, which would be a density of 0.79 people per acre. So 0.79 people per acre in the surrounding area. Okay, now for YWAM here, Youth with a Mission. Uh, uh, they, uh, again, you know, they provided us a, a sheet of uh, what they've got there, uh, what they're proposing. Uh, now the, the current uh, estimate, uh, estimation here is that uh, it appears that they currently might have 147 people on the land, and that's on the 31 acres, uh, which represents a, a density of 4.65 people per acre. And now that, that would be the current. Uh, now, if uh, this expansion does occur, uh, and we were provided that uh, there could now be 551 people on the site. That would represent uh, 461 uh, people living on there, plus another 90 uh, day users that, that come there. And that would be a density of 17.35 people to eight per acre. And as I mentioned before, uh, the surrounding area isn't, doesn't have that uh, number of people per acre, 17 pe uh, people per acre, but it's only 0.79 people per acre. That's 22 times more than what's in the surrounding area. So again, you know, are we still going to remain as a rural area? Now, I'll also mention that uh, of those, uh, of that, you know, again, there's 31 acres uh, on the youth with a mission versus 400 acres on the surrounding area. And on that 31 acres, there's only, there could be 551 people versus only 360 on a much larger area. Okay, now I did provide uh, on what I handed out there uh, some aerial photographs. And there's an attachment D. It uh, kind of shows what uh, an attachment D. It shows uh, what the rural, uh, I'm sorry, youth of the mission looks like around in that red line. And doesn't look uh, no, too bad there. Looking on the next attachment E, you can see, you know, again, that's where it's showing a bigger area that surrounds uh, youth of the mission. And you can see all the, the properties, that's that 400 acres I was talking about uh, with all the houses on it. But then, you know, if we go to, you know, to show that this is really a rural area, you, know, you go to attachment F, and it shows not only, you know, a, a small area of where YRAM, uh, youth of the mission is, and, and where the 400 acres of these other houses are, but you can see there's lots of open farmland has very little houses on there. So this is a very, very rural area. And that's something I think we would like to try to keep and protect. And now going back here again. 
Um, yeah. Okay, now another big concern now, we know we talked about there could be 551 people on there. We're getting past your five minutes, so I think, I think you, 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 oh. you, you've adequately made your point that there's gonna be a lot of people there. Yes. And then it's more people than there are in the, the surrounding area. So if, if there's another, it, look, it looks like you talked about water and septic. So if you want to talk about those, why don't you do that real quick? Oh, okay. Uh, you want me to talk about uh, the water? Well, you're sort of running out of time. Okay. So okay. I think you, 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 you made your point about the uh, about it, your position that's not rural because of all okay. the people. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just just uh, some water issues. Um, let's see, try to keep this uh, brief here. Let me talk about the. Uh, concerns uh, and uh, what we have in our, uh, our neighborhood is that there are uh, some people that have a low capacity in the wells, a low capacity of only one gallon per minute of water. Uh, there's also uh, some temporary periods of uh, dry wells. <laughs> some people just run out of water. They have to uh, hold off for a while before they get the water again. There's also um, the uh, and availability to find uh, suitable water sources on property. Um, there were some properties, uh, one property, you know, that drilled six wells and had to abandon all six because it couldn't get enough water. So I guess in brief, what I'm saying is that uh, there's already water problems uh, in, for some of our neighbors over there. Uh, just to get some more specific information on that, we had some studies done on uh, the wells. Uh, I was involved with uh, our neighborhood in trying to get uh, lots of the information of where we stood. Um, when the wells were originally put in, uh, this is back in 1980s, uh, uh, when the wells were uh, first drilled, they, the, the water, the static water level, uh, was about 100, an average of 122 degrees, uh, sorry, 122 feet below the ground level. But in the year 2015, uh, that static water level uh, dropped down to 357 feet. That's an average. Uh, so it dropped, you know, over 200 feet. I mean, that's, that's an average. And that's a static water level. When they start pulling water out, it even goes even lower. So a lot of people are already having problems with uh, water over there. Um, just to kind of move on here quickly here, uh, the septic uh, issues. Um, you know, there, there was, uh, um, looking at some old plans on Youth with a Mission, you know, there's about one acre of a uh, septic area uh, field there, uh, but now they're showing another 4.5 acres. So, you know, what people are gonna have concerns about is, you know, whether or not there's gonna be too much waste. We want to make sure that, you know, if there are a lot more people, we want to make sure that they keep their tanks cleaned uh, so that uh, lots of stuff doesn't get drained out in the field. So I'll All hold right. off. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> um, the next person is Mr. Rossling here. Okay, come on up. Hello. My name is David Rossling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G. I live at 3206 Deer Lake Court, Southeast Salem. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're prepared to give is true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you. Please go ahead. Well, I'll probably save us some time here because I'm not going to go on too long. But I, I'm here this afternoon to submit my written testimony in opposition to be considered as part of this hearing for youth with a missions conditional use permit app, CU 21004. In it, I focus on the numerous flood events on the lower portion of Battle Creek since just 1996. I compare FEMA's mapped special flood hazard area to youth with a missions proposed setback area along Battle Creek. And I also indicate the need for a base flood elevation to be established within the proposal area prior to any new development. I also touch on my concerns about how this scope of a development might affect available groundwater for wells of surrounding area, water quality for the Battle Creek, Mill Creek watershed, and transportation issues related to Battle Creek Road. And in closing, I guess I would say that 
This area is not supplied by any city water or city sewer systems. And so the, the increase of on-site water extraction and increase in on-site sewage disposal, I believe, is a, is a real concern. And so I see you're reading from your statement. Has that been submitted already, or is that something you want to submit right now? I have it here. Okay, why don't you just why don't you bring that up to me? Then. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your brevity. <laughs> um, Ken Van Ostel. to understand that maybe it wasn't received, so there you have it. Let's make sure it's definitely in here then. <laughs> okay. So my name is Ken Van Osdall. My last name is spelled V as in Victor, A-N-O-S-D-O-L. I live at 3375 Deer Lake Court Southeast in Salem. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony <laughs> you'll give will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please Thank go you. ahead. So first, uh, just as a bit of context, I, I, I want to express appreciation to Youth with Mission and to Mr. Matthias for what you said about what you do for the community. You all do a lot of really good work both here and abroad. And as somebody who was once in the Peace Corps, I appreciate good community service and I think you guys do great work. So I want to make sure that you know and understand that. Uh, and Mr. Grant, um, I appreciated your thoughtfulness about water uh, conservation. Is he still there? Uh, well, I appreciate his, in, in our family up in, in Deer Lake Court, we are really careful with how we use our water. My lawn goes brown in the summer. Don't water it. And uh, we raise our two kids to be careful with water use because we're on a well and there's not a whole lot of water there. So we're, we're well aware of, of those things. I, I have to say though, I was concerned when Mr. Grintz finished his, his, his uh, testimony and he said, uh, I think it has the potential, this is after signs on the faucet saying, turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth and showers every other night or whatever. He said, I think it has the potential for getting pretty close to being able to provide enough water for the community that you're proposing. And when it comes to water, I don't know that close is good enough. That was, it wasn't very compelling. And it tells me, it, under, it underscores, the youth with a mission, like the rest of us, understand there's a water problem out there. And, and it's not gonna go away easily. So my, my letter that I handed in to you really addresses <clears throat> the questions that you first addressed with the planning staff and asked whether or not that uh, criterion of, of, uh, of, of use and intent for the, the zone, whether that was just about, about kind of the, how the neighborhood feels, the rural character of it, or if it was really just about water. And the planning staff said, no, their interpretation was that it wasn't just about water, sewage, fire service, and so on, that it really had to do with the character of the neighborhood, the rural setting, and so on and so forth. So my letter will, will detail issues around population density. You made references to those earlier. And I'm not concerned about walking out seeing a community of 500 people all standing there at once and saying, well, gee, I'm in the middle of a small town here. But it's the impact on the land. It's the impact of that many people 24 seven all throughout the year on, on the land. And so I think that question is, is certainly a relevant one. And, and I think you've, you've heard staff and others make reference to that. I think the, I think one of the issues is, is bigger isn't always better. And while I appreciate the good work you all do, just being bigger, scaling it bigger, and saying, well, now we'll do greater things, I don't know that that always works that way. Sometimes bigger scaling is important. And, and in YWAM's case, this isn't their first time at the table to ask to be bigger, make, do more. And I guess the question is, where does the county finally set the limit and say, okay, that's, that's it? Given this piece of land, given the water resources, given the location, 
all those things, and given what the zoning requires, where's the limit? Or could they come back and put one more foot under the, under the tent, you know, until the Bedouin, you know the story. So, so I think that's an absolutely relevant question is, is where's the limit? Could they come back in five years and say, gosh, you know, we did really well with that last expansion. How about if we had another 150 kids? How, how, how do we determine that? And that's, I think, part of what's in, what's in your hands. Uh, I won't read the, the whole letter, but I would like to finish off just the last couple of paragraphs there. Sure. Um, and in the letter, again, I addressed population density issues and, you know, could I do this on my land and so on. But I said the YWAM proposal demonstrates the applicant's willingness to continually, year after year, quietly chip away at the boundaries and restrictions that are placed on lands, on land use in this AR zone. It ignores the impact it will have on the fragile groundwater that is shared by all neighbors and on the safety, security, and quality of life that we now enjoy in rural Marion County. I don't believe it was the intent of Oregon lawmakers and land use planners to allow unbridled growth in areas <clears throat> zoned for AR use. The land use proposed by YWAM is better suited for urban areas where it is compatible with adjacent lands and where suitable services can be provided for a dense resident population. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Judith Van Ostel. I take it, Judith. Same spelling of hostel, same address as your husband, so I'll just go ahead and swear you in. Already. So do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Austin. Thank you for the opportunity to bring you some additional information and to share that with you. I've got my stack here and I'll add to it. Uh, the first thing that I have that I will be giving you is uh, a petition. Uh, in the area around Youth With Mission. This was on Battle Creek, on Fox Hollow, on Deer Lake Court, on Mahalo, and on Fir Tree Lane. And we have 122 signatures. And on the uh, petition, it will list out what their main concerns are. Uh, in the petition, as I was taking this around to a variety of people, I heard a lot from neighbors uh, about their concerns. You've heard a lot about the water, the sewage, flooding. One thing I haven't heard too much about today is noise. There are a couple of neighbors who live within uh, very close, uh, a couple hundred feet to Youth With a Mission. And uh, one elderly gentleman and then another woman mentioned that uh, the noise, particularly in the summer and in the early fall, when there are special events at Youth With a Mission, they refer to it as that the noise sounds like a sports stadium. And that's with the current number of people. And if I um, understand it correctly, uh, my understanding is that there's around 200 people now at Youth With a Mission. So the concern is if, as you go over that, uh, how much bigger and how much more noise is there going to be? And, both these couples said that they hear the noise when they're in their house with the windows and doors closed. Um, others mentioned the wildlife, the, um, uh, as we've heard today, traffic danger, um, uh, the increase in density, the sewage, um, flooding. Uh, and one woman mentioned to me that she takes her granddaughter to school every day at around nine o'clock, I think she said. And she said, there's a long line of cars waiting to turn into youth with a mission now. That's not when the development has been uh, implemented. That's current. Um, so you have the petition. And also, um, I, uh, let me see here. I have one other that I, hmm? oh, here it is. Um, one of my neighbors mentioned concerns um, 
about the traffic, so I went back and looked at the traffic impact analysis. And so I had a couple of questions uh, that I'd like to share. One was, uh, on page 16, it says that the required intersection site distance needed for left turning vehicles to make a safe turn is 500 feet, and that was based on 45 miles per, per hour. A preliminary site distance evaluation was completed at the existing site driveway, and the available site distance exceeds that minimum required. It's time for Local Roots. Let's welcome today's guest, Redbird. she drew a circle around the proposed site plan and hand wrote a note. This is directly across from a three acre parcel at 6996 Battle Creek Southeast that is allowed only one home. In her conclusion, she said this proposal by Youth with a Mission is totally inappropriate for our rural area. And so I've included her letter in that information. Okay. Um, and so why don't you, you, you can just bring me that, the stuff you're submitting. I'll make sure that that gets into the record. I assume that hasn't been submitted yet, right? No, okay. not, that I, not that I know of. And okay. then um, my proposal, my submittal, uh, my testimony. So um, we've lived there for 32 years. Um, we're about 1,100 feet due east of Youth with a Mission, and I have a map that shows the placement of our home and the place of Youth with a Mission. 
Although I should say that uh, some Deer Lake parcels are within a few hundred feet of youth with a mission, much closer. Um, I'm concerned about the proposed expansion. Um, as many people for our county designated sensitive groundwater overlay zone, I won't go into too much of that, but I will say our well uh, is 497 feet deep. That's pretty darn deep. And it was originally drilled in 1983, and the static water level was 115 feet. 19 years later, in 2002, it was 336. And 13 years later, in 2015, it was 382 feet. And I have the documents attached. So we're extremely conservative with our water use, particularly in the summer months. We limit use of our washing machines, dishwasher. We limit running water for when we wash hands, and brush teeth, shower and bathing. We limit flushing toilets. We limit watering the outdoor plants. During the summer of 2017, when we were here before, was the first time we needed to truck water in. And I understand other neighbors did so as well. So I have the receipts of the delivered water attached. Um, in 2016, uh, the Oregon Water Resource Department began monitoring several wells in our area to determine the potential impact of water use by a new irrigated vineyard to the east. Now to have potentially youth with a mission expansion to the west, which is much closer in proximity to our property, increase its campus by hundreds of people is deeply concerning. Ms. Um, Vanoss, are, are you approaching the end? We've been... Yes, oh, okay. I am. I just have a couple more things. Uh, I put information in on Battle Creek Road that has not been discussed. So it's a main road, 55 mile an hour, bringing traffic from Turner directly to Salem with no walking paths, inadequate shoulders, significant wildlife crossings, and with multiple walkers and cyclists during the spring, summer, and fall months. Sections of the road have blind curves, curves on hills, and within a quarter of a mile of both sides of Youth with a Mission entrance, there are 22 residential driveways on both sides of the road and two streets. There is also a Cascade school bus stop and turnaround at the entrance of Youth with a Mission on Battle Creek Road and weekly commercial garbage pickups at each residential driveway on Battle Creek Road. Traffic density and velocity has increased in recent years. Moreover, with the addition of the new Costco at the intersection of Kubler and Battle Creek Road, traffic will continue to increase as customers south of Salem use Battle Creek Road as their new access to shopping. Um, and finally, more important, I refer to the uh, density. And um, if um, while I respect the work of Youth with a Mission, the, work, the good work that you all do, and I also was a Peace Corps volunteer and worked for the Peace Corps for 15 years, so I do respect that. But I do not believe that they should be allowed to increase their current allowed conditional use population of 200 residents and staff to then 551 residents and staff. Uh, this large increase in the number of occupants literally brings the University of Nations, as stated on the Youth with a Mission website, to a peaceful, quiet, rural area where wildlife is plentiful. Uh, and I have all my attachments yeah, here. You and to bring up, you know, I'll make sure they get put into the record. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next person would be can't make out the first name. The last name is Irving. It looks like it starts with a J. Kent. Wow. Okay. No. Oh, the, no. I had Kent next, but I had. But you, you can come first. That's fine. Ma'am, give you a letter. Yeah. And just for people who are coming, if you're just going to come and read your letter, it'll be in the record and I'll read it again later. So there's no need to, like, to read a letter into the record. I'm not, my name's Stephen Kent Irving, I-R-V-I-N-G. I live at 3285 Deer Lake Court, Southeast Salem, Oregon, 97317. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thanks. 
My wife and I have lived in Deer Lake the longest of anybody here right now, and the water level in Deer Lake has dropped significantly. We lived previously at 3296 Deer Lake Court, which was across the street. That well originally allowed for a home loan, and um, the water diminished so much in that well that we had to access uh, a well agreement that we had with the Edgars, who Rob already spoke. Um, uh, that was back in 1984. Um, we then sold that home. We built across the street a new home in 19... Ninety two. Ninety two. And um, sub subsequently after that home was built, because there was a well on that uh, property, we found out that that well step, which was 526 feet, was a saltwater well. If we all share the same aquifer, this is a, this is a concern. You, you, can't, you can't use salt water. So sub subsequently after that, we got the opportunity to drill another well. Uh, which was to the west of our of that of that well, because there has to be distance between wells as, as well, and that well has um, dropped significantly in its time over the past few years. Like what I'm trying to get to is the water tables dropped. We've had our static water uh, checked as well. Well, I also know previous owner Vic Town, who's across the street. His well was diminished significantly. Prior neighbors, Kenley and Lorraine Adams, their well went to one gallon a minute. Um, again, water is a huge is is huge is a huge issue. And we we too like what YRAM does. We just don't have city water available. We don't have any other options. As a neighborhood, we were going to swim, put a swimming pool in one, at one point in time. We chose not to because of the water that it was going to consume, and it would be a hardship on the adjoining neighborhood. And that was a big deal because we, our kids liked the possibility to swim. YWAM's proposal would be more than one swimming pool. And we as a collective neighborhood chose not to do that out of respect for one another and out of fairness that we have water to sustain each other's viability. If YRAN had city water and city sewer to their location, this would be a whole different story. They don't. And I don't know that they'll ever get it in my lifetime. And I think that's a, that is a genuine concern on top of being in the floodplain that other neighbors have already brought up. You can't get rid of bad water in a floodplain area. It then pollutes further water. Um, bicyclists. Salem, Salem Bike Club uses Battle Creek frequently for their rides. It's a 55 mile an hour road. There's no shoulders. There's no bike lane either. It's a big deal. It's a, it's a hazard. When you start adding a, additional traffic count on Battle Creek that, that the proposal um, would initiate, it's a further danger. Again, it's another thing where if, if, if you want to expand, then provide the services for the expansion, including the bike lane. That seems to be a necessity in that area. Um, I think that's all I had. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Irving. You're welcome. Um, Ms. Irving, did you want to testify too, or you don't have to? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, oh, we got Arlene Edgar. Did, did you want to testify? No. You're good? Okay, thank you. Um, Sam Thomas, I think? No, I was with the applicant on the... Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, there's a lease around. Okay. Um, Rick Budke? Oh, okay. Um, so that was the prior home we owned. Okay. And this, I guess, Jackie Buckey's gone as well. Um, Bob and Joanna Buckley. There's a whole page of people that just signed up just to get that, the notice. Oh, okay. Session. I'll just run, I'll run through it quick just to make sure. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Radkovich. Sure. Oh, 
Did you want to testify, sir? Sure, why not? <laughs> All right, come on, now. come on down. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Radakovich, R A D A K O V I C H. I live at 3316 Deer Lake Court, which is probably about a half half mile from your location, give or take. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're going to give will be true to the best of your knowledge? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, not testimony, just fact. Uh, Rob uh, indicated in his testimony about one of the wells in the neighborhood that's pumping one gallon or less per hour or minute, and that happens to be my well. <coughs> the county in 2016 issued a permit, permit number G is in golf, 17614. <clears throat> that permit was for the Mandeva Vineyard that was established in our vicinity to establish wells and start tapping into the water aquifer that everybody's talking about. Nobody has a map of what this aquifer looks like, i.e. Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, it's one of those things nobody can put a finger on. <clears throat> Since that uh, permit was approved by the county in June, six months later I had my well tested by Mac Drilling, which is documented. That test ran for 30 minutes until I started pumping silt and had to clear the pipes. That well is rated right now at one gallon or less per minute. And I don't know of anybody that's going to guarantee that we're going to continue to maintain water for our property. You're talking about a resource, which is water, no different than vegetation, trees, timber, and managing that water, I think, is everybody's responsibility. And right now, I'm on the edge of having to have another well punched on my property or making other arrangements to have water trucked in. And that's current right now. That's all I have. I've already issued that uh, testimony and you should have it on file it was a letter delivered to your department on the 29th of March. Oh, okay. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Thank um, you. Let's see. Um, is Annette Stewart here? Um, Mary Lynn White Wright? Um, Bennett White, not sure what the last part of it is. No Bennett here, okay. Um, William Mack, these must be the folks who just wanted to copy. Ben Bednars, Jennifer Gallick. And I think we don't have anybody else outside, is that right? That's okay, good. Um, we're getting close here. Um, Rob Simpson. Marlene Gallick. Um, Anthony Sharp. Mike Dyer. Terry Dyer or Chris Dyer. All right, I think. Is there anybody else in the room who wanted to testify who hasn't had a chance? Okay, we got a couple folks on the phone, one, one opponent and then the applicant's other attorney. So we will take care of that.
Mr. Stecker? Yes, it is. Hi, I don't, this is Fred Wilson, the hearings officer. I don't know if you've been following along on TV. I have. Well, thank you for your patience. Um, it's, it's finally your turn. Um, usually we tell folks it, it, it's probably not a good idea to try to watch at the same time you're talking. It leads to feedback and distortion. I muted, muted the uh, other device. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, so why don't you give us your full name, spell your last name, sure. your address, and then I'll swear you in. You bet. My name is Carl Robert Stecker, S-T-E-C-K-E-R. I reside at 3395 Deer Lake Court, Southeast in Salem. I am um, a retired uh, deputy district attorney from Marion County and still licensed by the Oregon State Bar. And, I um, oh. had a submittal that I already put in on February 19th or thereabouts. Uh, it was submitted with the we're all Battle Creek material, and there's a lot of detail in there and specific sites to statutes, OARs, and uh, to Marion County zoning ordinance uh, references. So I won't trouble you with all that. Okay, and I did read um, through that. I would like to address um, some of the issues that come up today, as well as um, some other matters that aren't contained in my testimony, nor others that I've heard today. Uh, first off, um, I'll just give you a little introduction. My property is 370 feet east of uh, YWAM. It's um, located uh, directly east on a bluff, and um, my well is about 700 feet from YWAM. I've had many of the problems that have been discussed by others with regard to well static water level dropping. In fact, the REM geologic report that is the applicant's exhibit 104, if you look at figure three, his number 45 well is mine. It's used in many of his discussions. On page seven, he refers to my well as well as that of the Van Hostels. And he um, indicates that you know the levels have been consistently dropping the static water levels five to 10 feet per year. His, uh, his um, discussion also talks about the source of the water. And if you uh, read on his page seven, he talks about uh, the marine shale, which predominates to the east of YWAM and supplies uh, some of their water, but the recharge rate for marine shale is only a 10% rate. And a lot of these studies have used the basalt recharge level of 22%. And in another part of his testimony or his report, he indicates that the recharge level from, from the marine shale sources are only a third of those from the salt. So that impacts certainly uh, some of the uh, calculations that are used with regard to the Marion County stock value and how close we are on a marginal basis to that. I'll point out too that the GSI solutions uh, letter, which is it, um, uh, a company's Oregon uh, Water Resources Department report indicates again, there's a cross connectivity across multiple aquifers. Consequently, there's a potential hydraulic connection between the aquifers as well as to the, to the Battle Creek itself. So that's uh, an important factor. Um, I believe there's some exhibits that have been put in by others that show photographs of flooding that has occurred. Um, and as that flows across these aquifers, some of the well, the well on Wyland's property, um, the, the main well apparently, is very close to the surface, the head of it, the top of the water level. And there's, they point out that there's a uh, possibility of contamination to and from the stream because of its situation. Their second well is located on Tax Lot 1000. It's not even on YWAM property. And that's clearly shown in the DEQ analysis that um, you know, they did some test testing in the fall of 2020 to determine suitable sites for septic. And uh, there's a map on there. It shows the well over the line, and it's clearly on um, Lot 1000, which is in another owner. And that gets back to the connectivity of their system. Right now, seven other users besides YWAM um, access this community well system that they have. So obviously, all the calculations have to allow for uh, 525 gallons per per day usage for residents in rural agricultural areas or rural um, DRA zone, and they have to uh, that would be almost 3,500 gallons just attributed to the seven offsite users of the YWAM uh, collective system. I would concur with the planning staff's recommendation regarding denial denial for the. Um, 7, uh, 128.0407C uh, adequate water 
um, provision. Yeah, that criteria has not been met by all that I've heard today. And I think it's uh, very ambitious to think that a lot of young folks would practice the degree of conservation measures that those of us in the neighborhood have to exercise with no irrigation, limited showers, no concurrent running of appliances, a number of things. And to coordinate that among 500 people would be just impractical and probably not uh, possible. There's been a lot of talk about the scale and harmony of the, of the area. Uh, this is like placing a municipality equivalent to the population of St. Paul or Gates, Oregon, in the middle of a little valley uh, and 32 acres within that valley. It's um, one mile outside the urban growth boundary. The urban growth boundary is set to limit, basically, um, rural, de uh, rural development, and I should say, you know, urban development, and not allow it to spill over into rural-like settings. Uh, here, they're clearly trying to emulate a college campus with a lot of hard speed, and the density um, is presumed by state law. Oregon um, Administrative Rule 6004-0040 at 1.5 acres per acre, 1.5 persons per acre. And consequently, this is vastly greater in density, and this violates the state law with regard to reasonable densities. So how do you get, you made some, can you hear me, Mr. Stecker? Yes, I can. So you made some arguments like on the lines you were just talking about, um, like rural residential policy 15, I think, um, from the, the Marion County Comprehensive Plan, as well as some statewide planning goals. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you think, what's your theory on why those are applicable? Well, if the county has promulgated um, a, a certain policy with respect to how things ought to be developed, it would be important to, I think, think look at the intent of that policy and how it relates to the ordinances that were drafted and the particular um, criteria that is by which a, um, a development is, is uh, judged. And I just think that obviously the, the language in sub A that you were discussing with proponent's attorney, um, you know, it, it's stated twice. That language uh, appears not only in 17-128-040, but also in uh, 110, or I should say 010 under the purpose. And I think it's in two different places because it says two different things. In, in, in 010, it provides, um, and it's it perhaps joined with uh, the ability to provide public services, as I think the attorney agreed. Um, but it also says it's compromised. It, it has to not compromise the rural character of the area. However, in 128.040, the A, the conditional use, has to be in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zone. And that purpose and intent of the zone is established in large measure by what the statewide planning goals um, are, are articulated, that you know, have articulated how rural development should proceed. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the criteria under 040, um, I want to point out that um, fire protection is an issue. And if you use all your resources to fight a fire uh, or a drain out a storage tank and the fire is still burning, what are you going to do? And so I'm not sure that, that the inchoate nature right now of the uh, work with Turner Fire District is adequate to, to guarantee that, in fact, fire suppression needs to be met, but particularly in view of you know, the wildfire activity that we've all experienced, even if somewhat remotely here at this specific location, it's still uh, an issue that we need to address uh, as the summers get drier and hotter. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, with regard to just the harmony um, argument, that um, they are proposing to add uh, to their current 53,000 square feet of buildings, but we don't know how many square feet they want to add. We can't judge because they've not provided anything with respect to the building sizes and so forth. Um, we know that there's approximately 22 new buildings or uh, replacement buildings, but um, exactly how that fits you know, into the scale of things is it's, uh, it's unknown. There's just not enough detail in their submissions. And of course, Rob has some analysis on that. Um, I would like to point out 
what's, I think, an important issue, and that is your jurisdiction to decide this case with respect to the RV park um, particularly. The RV park was never explicitly approved by any order in any conditional use case. In spite of the fact that there's been five of them, it's scantily measured. It's mentioned only in the first one as some RV sites, and they, at that time they were located on lot 600. Now they're uh, going to uh, propose a new use on new land by putting uh, an RV park of 12 um, units, 12 locations, 12 spaces on lot 100. Lot 100 is currently rural. It's got an old barn on it, but it's basically pasture. And it's a new use on that land. Consequently, it's more than just a mere expansion of their current use. It's not clear that a RV park is that uh, a sort of thing that's customarily associated with religious purpose. And that's one of their criteria um, <clears throat> uh, with respect to uh, 17, 110, 472, that, that you can allow some reasonable uses of property that are customarily associated with religious use. But there's adequate residential properties being uh, proposed that it's not really necessary for residents. There's also a new limitation on the statewide level, uh, OAR 660-004-0040, sub 14, little a, little d, which provides that you can only have three RVs maximum um, in an AR zone. And so <clears throat> this proposal is, is greatly uh, more. Uh, there's also on uh, their applicants 109, um, you'll see that they charge a $100, $150 fee, which makes it a commercial use. Uh, that's, that fee is charged for each RV site. Um, commercial uses are addressed by 17-128-045, which basically limits the use of commercial uh, application in property, in rural property, to farm-related purposes. And again, these folks, once upon a time, espoused having um, an agricultural training purpose with demonstration gardens on uh, a very rural use of the land, but it's morphed more into now uh, an educational facility uh, that trains folks to, to obviously do good works, and we congratulate them on that, but it's different than the original purpose and intent. Um, the other new uses on the land include this ropes course. Now, that's never been approved. It's not specifically listed. There is, in fact, a conditional use that denied extension of a ropes um, facility, climbing tower, I'm sorry, but not, never was there mentioned at the ropes course. It's not clear where it is. It's not shown on their site plan. It's a commercial use. They advertise um, inviting a fee paying public to come and pay to use it. Um, it's not been permitted. It's not mentioned in any conditional use application, and it's not customarily associated with religious use. Sports court is obviously a new crop, new use on the land, um, and it's not been um, uh, uh, addressed as far as its um, proximity to the drain field. Uh, finally, um, the sewage processing facility on lot 100 or 400 is a new use on that property. So these are not just mere expansions. These are new uses on new land. Because of the violations that have in, by having an RV park already that exceeds two unit, three units and not having been approved, and also the ropes course of the commercial venture, um, these are uh, violations and, and basically violate 17.110.680, which provides that no land use approval can be granted um, if, the, if the land is being used in violation of local, state, or federal law. And so the argument Mr. Lean is, is obviously also made is that you lack jurisdiction to approve the application by virtue of, of Section 680. So I would also join his motion uh, to dismiss based on that by those violations. Okay. In fact, uh, also the uh, proponents have admitted that they exceeded the 200 person limit that was established in CU 90-114, I think it's section 14. And so we clearly 
um, you know, it, it's already been an indication that opponents have been pushing the limits on several aspects of uh, the use of that property. Um, the floodplain is not adequately addressed in their application. The waterway runs right through. It's shown to be about 100 feet in some areas. Mr. Stucker, are you getting close? 140 feet. Are you getting close so, to the end? I kind of let you go extra long since you had to wait so long, but do you maybe okay. sort of get to conclusion? Sure. Thanks. I'll give you a quick conclusion and uh, point out that you know this is a rural and pastoral area. Yes, they've been in operation for 40 years. However, this is a such a large expansion that threatens our our potential um, water resources uh, in our in rural residences. We don't have any recourse, and clearly, most of these um, uh, expansions, you know, are just out of character for our little valley here. Um, we think they should be confined to the population they serve today. We congratulate them on the good work they do. However, um, this is just trying to put an elephant in a small tent. It's just too much for the site. Um, and I also join in the, you, you granted a motion for continuance or uh, uh, leaving the record open at least. And so um, with that, I conclude, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And again, thank you for being patient and waiting until last. We, we do appreciate that. Uh, okay. Um, Alan isn't gonna do rebuttal. I'll just handle it here. Oh, okay, great. Um, we, this would be the time for staff to have anything they want to add if they want to. Staff doesn't have anything to add at this time. Thank you. I do have one quick question sure. for you. Um, the issue they raised about um, if somebody's in violation that they can't get an approval, um, what's your position on A, how that works, and B, whether you think they're in violation if their ropes course is open to the public or maybe even the RV park, and whether they having 215 uh, people there instead of 200, how that affects it. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how um, we have looked um, at that type of violation in the past. Um, I, if, if it's okay, I'd like to take that back to uh, the department and have that discussion. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Ms. Pedigo, now <laughs> your time to, for a rebuttal. Thank you for being patient. Of course. Um, we'll try and keep it as brief as, as possible, and so we'll mostly confine our rebuttal to issues raised here in person and respond to those in written testimony in written testimony. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to call up Sam from Lenity. He was on our list, but um, he can respond to some of the aesthetic concerns that were raised. Good evening, Sam Thomas, Lenity Architecture, 3150 Kettle Court, Southeast Salem, Oregon. Uh, last name, T-H-O-M-A-S. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Okay. So um, I helped Michael Fuller, the uh, architect, with the site plan design. Um, and just wanted to point out uh, there hadn't been a lot of discussion there had been some discussion on the site, um, but um, as far as the applicant, we hadn't really addressed um, too much on that during the presentation. So I just want to, oh, sure. Uh, just wanted to address you know, some of the site design elements. Um, this particular plan doesn't have all the landscaping and topography that was actually submitted with the application. Um, but just to point out to you know, the aesthetically, you know, we tried to keep the buildings clustered in certain sections of the property in order to, um, you know, reduce the impact of the mass and bulk of the, of the site. Um, you know, obviously there is parking that's going to be needed for the different uses on the site, but that's tried to be clustered around those uses instead of one giant parking area. Um, and then also in regards to the building design, you know, this is the conceptual plan, um, you know, 
if and when approval you know may happen more specific details on the the buildings would be uh, provided at a you know point of building permits um, in compliance you know obviously planning staff at that time would look at the height and um, uh, you know size of the buildings to make sure they comply with the AR zone requirements um, so I just yeah and if you had any questions on the site um, you know we didn't really spend too much time on that so I just want to see if you had any questions that I could answer there were a couple people who, who said they thought that some of the buildings were within the 100 foot setback is that we be able to show one way or the other whether what well, that's the case um, I don't have the FEMA floodplain um, shown on this particular plan, no no, no like the 100 foot setback to the uh, agricultural land to the like the, the property boundary I forget which buildings people were saying but they were saying basically any buildings have to be set back 100 feet from other properties so my understanding, I just looked up the AR zone development standards. Front setback is 20 feet. The sides is 10, and the rear is 20. Okay, that's so, what I was thinking. So, so the, the, yeah, the buildings, there are some existing, um, obviously, that may not be in compliance with that setback because they were probably established, you know, at a different time. I, I don't know the exact history of each building development, um, but there are some that are close to the property line. Um, but all new buildings would be in compliance with the AR zone setbacks. Okay. I may be getting confused about which setbacks people are arguing about, but I know there were some that say they couldn't tell from the site plan. And, and as uh, you guys said, this isn't as specific as some of the site plans. So maybe just to, when you do your rebuttal uh, to the open record period, just to make sure that you address the ones that got raised. Did you want to add something, Mr. Right. Dyer? I think you're going to clarify what I was trying to get at. Yeah, I think there is a 100-foot um, setback from any uh, resource, resource zone. Resource land, for, right. Yeah. For, um, so that, I, was, that, I was thinking about what they said correctly. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So do you remember which ones? So the, 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 the resource zones would be on the top of that map, basically, right? Uh, yes. Yep. So are there some, I can't tell from here, are there some buildings that might be encroaching into 100 feet on that? Well, anyway... Ms. Vandergo, maybe uh, during the open record period, you guys could address that. Yeah, I think they're talking about the northern portion of the RV park. Okay. So we'll address it. Okay. So the AR ones with the, 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 the lesser setbacks, 20. I don't remember anybody arguing about those, but it was the 100 foot for the, the uh, SA zone. Or whichever resource then it was, I think it was SA. Okay. All right. Sorry Thank to you. confuse you with that. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, so applicant is aware, obviously, that there is the opposition to this proposal and that there are concerns regarding traffic in the water supply. When we originally ex proposed this expansion in two 2017, um, those were brought up, we heard them, we have attempted to resolve as much of that, those evidentiary questions as is possible, and we'll continue to do so. We would like to thank the neighbors for their um, kind of cordial and factual testimonies and for keeping things fact-oriented, and we hope that we can continue to work with the neighbors in the surrounding area to address the outstanding issues. One thing we did want to note um, when talking about the aquifer in regards to the phone testimony, he brought up different recharge rates. In the SGO zone, there's a 90% recharge rate requirement for an aquifer. We're proposing under our hydrological review budget having a maximum of 22%. Um, so we're well within the norm for the SGO zone and our hydrological review indicates that our aquifer is in basalt and not in marine sediment. Um, we also want to reiterate that this is an existing use that dates back 40 years and pre-exists much of the opposition here today. While this it does represent an intensification of existing uses, they are uses that have existed and been approved for the property through the conditional use permit process before the county. And we are operating within those parameters it, as there are no existing enforcement cases open against the property. 
where there are concerns, we're happy to address those, but we are currently in compliance. Um, with regards to the engineering comment regarding the proportionate share, one of the conditions of approval proposed by staff is that the applicant pay its, proportion, its STC fees. Where an STC fee is applied against a property, it addresses the payments needed for updates of the system overall. The county needs to demonstrate a specific nexus to the proportionate share requirement for the imp improving the Delaney um, Parish, Gap, Parish Gap Road intersection. <laughs> and um, without providing that additional nexus, it's not appropriate here. Finally, we know that water is an issue. We are sensitive to that. I personally was also a Peace Corps volunteer, and during that time, I lived on about 50 liters of 50 gallons of water a week. So it is possible through behavior change and through conservation practices to bring our use within the legal limits. It may not be ideal, but we are committed to making sure that we are using the amount of water that we are legally allowed to use and not exceeding that through the proposed conditions of approval. Um, at this point, given the amount of evidence in the record that we have to review and respond to, we're requesting a 28-day open record period with a 14-day rebuttal, a 14-day response period, and a seven-day rebuttal period after that. And we're happy to grant any extension that the county may need to facilitate that. So just to uh, make clear, so for people who don't understand uh, the way it works, is what we're going to do is we're going to close the public hearing tonight. So this is the last time for people to come in and actually testify. But we're going to leave the record open so you can submit anything in writing that you want to, just like you could have before today, just like a lot of people brought in today. Um, and so there's three parts to that open record period. The first part is sort of we call the new evidence period. You can submit anything you want, new evidence, testimony, or argument about any issue. And do I understand you want four weeks for that first period? Yes, please. Okay. And then there's a second period, which kind of we call the responsive period, where you can actually submit new evidence, argument, and testimony, but only to respond to stuff that came in during the first period. So it's not an opportunity to make brand new arguments. So if anybody submits evidence about traffic and wells during this first four weeks that the, the record is open, you can spend those next two weeks responding to that evidence. And then finally, there's a third period, which will just be a week, with the applicant's final legal argument. They don't get to submit any new evidence, but they get to make their legal argument saying basically why, here's why we think we should get approved. And if anybody has any questions about that, uh, planning staff is usually really helpful explaining how that works, telling you how to submit that evidence. It's kind of the same way you've done it before. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll get your question in just a second. Um, and so that, that's how that will work. So um, Ms. Childers, so, sir, you had a question? I did. We're, we're four lots away from YRAM, and we never received any mail at all about their expansion from them. Is there a way that they can be responsible to provide information to the neighboring areas regarding the rebuttals and whatever this open period is? In case that wasn't on the record, the gentleman was asking whether the, the applicant could be responsible for getting information to neighbors. And no, um, if you talk to the planning department, that'll, that's the best way. Sometimes they can forward stuff if it's electronic or at least let you know what's been submitted. So the best way is to stay in contact with the planning department to find out what's been submitted. Um, so just to, be, just to reiterate, four weeks for the first open record period, two weeks for the responsive period, one week for your final legal argument, and you're agreeing to extend the 150 days for those, what is it, seven weeks? Yes. Okay. All right. I think with that, that will conclude today's proceedings. Like I said, we'll close the public hearing. The record is left open for those periods. Again, if you have questions about how to submit evidence or get copies of that evidence, please contact the planning department. They're always very helpful with that kind of thing. And then after the record's closed, I will start writing my decision after that, and everyone in here will get a copy of the decision. And again, so thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. And it's been a long afternoon. And thank you for being cordial and polite, everybody getting along. That doesn't always happen, so thank you. And everyone have a good night. Thanks.